If so, it would all be worth it. If you feel the way I do, share it. May my voice become yours. Thanks for watching. The Andrew Holness administration is embarking on the most comprehensive constitutional reform work to be undertaken in the nation of Jamaica with a view to craft a new modern constitution of Jamaica. The goal is not simply to swap a foreign monarch, the King of England, for a local president. We hope to use the opportunity to facilitate a reset of the nation moving to a culture of excellence and discipline. A message from the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs. What does the government's constitutional reform program include? The work will be executed in three phases. Phase one will involve repatriation of our constitution abolition of the constitutional monarchy and the establishment of the Republic of Jamaica, together with all other matters for which we need a referendum. Phase two, we will review the wordings and provisions of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedom and all other provisions that are ordinarily entrenched. By the time we get to phase three, we will do a full assessment of our nation's legal and constitutional infrastructure. And this will facilitate drafting of our new constitution of Jamaica, which will reflect appreciation and understanding of our cultural heritage, our governance challenges, and our development aspirations, and which will embody the will of the people of Jamaica. A message from the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs. A high-level constitutional reform committee has been established. The role of this committee is to assist in providing expert guidance and oversight to the government and people of Jamaica during the constitutional reform process that will implement recommendations on which consensus exists while helping to build consensus where it has eroded or is non-existent on related reform matters. This high-level constitutional reform committee will assess how the passage of time has impacted the recommendations of the Joint Select Committee on Constitutional and Electoral Reform contained in the report of 1995 which were submitted to and approved by the Parliament, and they will advise on what fresh perspectives are to be considered in light of developments between then and now. The Constitutional Reform Committee is also to assist in coordinating the required parliamentary cross aisles and nationwide consultation and collaboration during the various phases of Jamaica's constitutional reform work. The committee will help to educate the electorate on uh, their role in the referendum process to successfully transition Jamaica from a constitutional monarchy to a republic. A message from the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs.
As children, we learn the true meaning of being a hero. Being a hero requires great sacrifice for others, for others, not just ourselves. We learn about the heroes of Jamaica's past and how much of themselves and their lives they had to give in building a nation we should be proud to call home. They believed in a Jamaica that was more than just a country, more than just an island, more than lanterned by water. They believed in a dream of a free nation of people, a nation built on the foundation of their sacrifices, a nation of many people working as one, a nation that would continue to produce legends and nation builders that serve towards that vision. As children, we were also taught the National Pledge, a solemn promise, an undertaking. I would like to believe Sir Hugh Sherlock, while writing this pledge, understood the vision and dreams of our heroes. It's clear being a hero is too much to ever ask any one citizen. Luckily, the pledge does not require heroics of any of us. It merely asks that we honor our heroes by striving to advance our nation and ultimately inspire the world, like they and many Jamaicans have done. It's important we remember those words. These words. Before God and all mankind, I pledge the love and loyalty of my heart, the wisdom and courage of my mind, the strength and vigor of my body in service of my fellow citizens. I promise to stand up for justice, brotherhood and peace, to work diligently and creatively, to think generously and honestly, so that Jamaica may, under God, increase in beauty, fellowship and prosperity, and play her part in advancing the welfare of the whole human race. If you are like me, a Jamaican born and raised on this land, maybe you will remember saying those words, singing that song in a classroom or some general assembly. If so, like me, you made a pledge. Somehow it seems like many of us have forgotten that. The crime and violence, the indiscipline and short-sightedness, the corruption, the lack of respect for our beautiful lands we are blessed with, and the waters that surround and nurtures us. We have to do better. Let us honor our heroes so that they would not have sacrificed so much in vain. I hope this video can make a difference to even one soul. If so, it would all be worth it. 
If you feel the way I do, share it. May my voice become yours. Thanks for watching. The Andrew Holness administration is embarking on the most comprehensive constitutional reform work to be undertaken in the nation of Jamaica with a view to craft a new modern constitution of Jamaica. The goal is not simply to swap a foreign monarch, the King of England, for a local president. We hope to use the opportunity to facilitate a reset of the nation moving to a culture of excellence and discipline. A message from the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs. What does the government's constitutional reform program include? The work will be executed in three phases. Phase one will involve repatriation of our constitution abolition of the constitutional monarchy and the establishment of the Republic of Jamaica, together with all other matters for which we need a referendum. Phase two, we will review the wordings and provisions of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedom and all other provisions that are ordinarily entrenched. By the time we get to phase three, we will do a full assessment of our nation's legal and constitutional infrastructure. And this will facilitate drafting of our new constitution of Jamaica, which will reflect appreciation and understanding of our cultural heritage, our governance challenges, and our development aspirations, and which will embody the will of the people of Jamaica. A message from the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs. A high-level constitutional reform committee has been established. The role of this committee is to assist in providing expert guidance and oversight to the government and people of Jamaica during the constitutional reform process that will implement recommendations on which consensus exists while helping to build consensus where it has eroded or is non-existent on related reform matters. This high-level constitutional reform committee will assess how the passage of time has impacted the recommendations of the Joint Select Committee on Constitutional and Electoral Reform contained in the report of 1995 which were submitted to and approved by the Parliament, and they will advise on what fresh perspectives are to be considered in light of developments between then and now. The Constitutional Reform Committee is also to assist in coordinating the required parliamentary cross aisles and nationwide consultation and collaboration during the various phases of Jamaica's constitutional reform work. The committee will help to educate the electorate on uh, their role in the referendum process to successfully transition Jamaica from a constitutional monarchy to a republic. A message from the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs.
As children, we learn the true meaning of being a hero. Being a hero requires great sacrifice for others, for others, not just ourselves. We learn about the heroes of Jamaica's past and how much of themselves and their lives they had to give in building a nation we should be proud to call home. They believed in a Jamaica that was more than just a country, more than just an island, more than lanterned by water. They believed in a dream of a free nation of people, a nation built on the foundation of their sacrifices, a nation of many people working as one, a nation that would continue to produce legends and nation builders that serve towards that vision. As children, we were also taught the National Pledge, a solemn promise, an undertaking. I would like to believe Sir Hugh Sherlock, while writing this pledge, understood the vision and dreams of our heroes. It's clear being a hero is too much to ever ask any one citizen. Luckily, the pledge does not require heroics of any of us. It merely asks that we honor our heroes by striving to advance our nation and ultimately inspire the world, like they and many Jamaicans have done. It's important we remember those words. These words. Before God and all mankind, I pledge the love and loyalty of my heart through wisdom and courage of my mind, the strength and vigor of my body in service of my fellow citizens. I promise to stand up for justice, brotherhood, and peace, to work diligently and creatively, to think generously and honestly, so that Jamaica may, under God, increase in beauty, fellowship, and prosperity, and play her part in advancing the welfare of the whole human race. If you are like me, a Jamaican born and raised on this land, maybe you will remember saying those words, singing that song in a classroom or some general assembly. If so, like me, you made a pledge. Somehow it seems like many of us have forgotten that. The crime and violence, the indiscipline and short-sightedness, the corruption, the lack of respect for our beautiful lands we are blessed with, and the waters that surround and nurtures us. We have to do better. Let us honor our heroes so that they would not have sacrificed so much in vain. I hope this video can make a difference to even one soul. If so, it would all be worth it.
If you feel the way I do, share it. May my voice become yours. Thanks for watching. The Andrew Holness administration is embarking on the most comprehensive constitutional reform work to be undertaken in the nation of Jamaica with a view to craft a new modern constitution of Jamaica. The goal is not simply to swap a foreign monarch, the King of England, for a local president. We hope to use the opportunity to facilitate a reset of the nation moving to a culture of excellence and discipline. A message from the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs. What does the government's constitutional reform program include? The work will be executed in three phases. Phase one will involve repatriation of our constitution abolition of the constitutional monarchy and the establishment of the Republic of Jamaica together with all other matters for which we need a referendum. Phase two, we will review the wordings and provisions of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedom and all other provisions that are ordinarily entrenched. By the time we get to phase three, we will do a full assessment of our nation's legal and constitutional infrastructure. And this will facilitate drafting of our new constitution of Jamaica, which will reflect appreciation and understanding of our cultural heritage, our governance challenges, and our development aspirations, and which will embody the will of the people of Jamaica. A message from the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs. A high-level constitutional reform committee has been established. The role of this committee is to assist in providing expert guidance and oversight to the government and people of Jamaica during the constitutional reform process that will implement recommendations on which consensus exists while helping to build consensus where it has eroded or is non-existent on related reform matters. This high-level constitutional reform committee will assess how the passage of time has impacted the recommendations of the Joint Select Committee on Constitutional and Electoral Reform contained in the report of 1995 which were submitted to and approved by the Parliament, and they will advise on what fresh perspectives are to be considered in light of developments between then and now. The Constitutional Reform Committee is also to assist in coordinating the required parliamentary cross aisles and nationwide consultation and collaboration during the various phases of Jamaica's constitutional reform work. The committee will help to educate the electorate on their role in the referendum process to successfully transition Jamaica from a constitutional monarchy to a republic. A message from the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs.
As children, we learn the true meaning of being a hero. Being a hero requires great sacrifice for others, for others, not just ourselves. We learn about the heroes of Jamaica's past and how much of themselves and their lives they had to give in building a nation we should be proud to call home. They believed in a Jamaica that was more than just a country, more than just an island, more than land surrounded by water. They believed Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. May I begin by acknowledging the Honorable Marlene Malahu Fort, or Minister of Legal and Constitutional Affairs, members of the Constitution Reform Committee, and I'd like to take the time just to mention the members of this very important committee as we come to you this afternoon from the what we like to call in Montego Bay the magic city of Montego Bay but we're in very historic Sam Sharp Square at the cultural center and so I'm going to take the time to acknowledge the members of this very important committee we have ambassador Rocky Mead who is co-chair in the office of the prime minister and he's actually with us here in Montego Bay today we have some of the committee members who are online Dr. Derek McCoy, Attorney General of Jamaica. We also want to acknowledge Senator the Honorable Tom Tavares Finson, President of the Senate and Commissioner of the Electoral Commission of Jamaica. Online, Senator Ransford Braham, Government Senator, and to Senator Donna Scott Motley, Parliamentary Opposition in the Senate. Mr. Anthony Hilton is on stage with us here in Montego Bay, parliamentary opposition in the House of Representatives. Dr. the Honorable Lloyd Barnett, online. And of course, he's a national constitutional law expert. We have Mr. Hugh Small, KC, consultant counsel and nominee of the leader of the parliamentary opposition. Dr. Elaine McCarthy, chairman of the umbrella groups of churches. Dr. David Henry, wider society, faith-based, and I believe Dr. Elaine McCarthy and Dr. David Henry are with us here in Montego Bay, and so too is Dr. Nadine Spence, civil society, and she is a social and political commentator. Online, we have Mrs. Lalita Davis-Mattis from the National Council on Reparation. Our youth advisor, Sujay Su Boswell, and we have Professor Richard Albert as well, international constitutional law expert at the University of Texas. Mr. Christopher Harper is the senior constitutional reform officer in the ministry, and of course, our permanent secretary. Mr. Wayne Robertson, who is head of the secretariat, is also with us. And that completes the members of the committee, which I want to acknowledge this afternoon for their hard work thus far. Our Custis, who's always with us, Honorable Bishop Conrad Pitkin, Custis Rotolorum for the Parish of St. James, His Worship, Councillor Leroy Williams, welcome, sir. Senator Charles Sinclair, who is right here in hometown, and we have a number of councillors who are with us today, Justices of the Peace who have joined us for this very important discussion. Our President of the Montego Bay Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Mr. Oral Heaven, good to see you, sir. Members of the media, and of course, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all, welcome, welcome, welcome. 
On behalf of the Minister of Legal and Constitutional Affairs, I welcome you to this very, very important discussion as we talk about the road to Jamaica becoming a republic. Now, we have allocated most of the time this evening for your questions and answers, which will be given. We have many of the members that are here who will be able to discourse with you. But we want to set the stage by giving you the information. And before I invite Dr. Elaine McCarthy to bring God's blessings this afternoon, I want to also acknowledge those persons who have joined us online via the Jamaica Information Services YouTube and Facebook channels. We also have persons joining us on the ministry's Facebook and YouTube channels. And we have persons who are joining us live on Mellow FM. Those who are joining by Zoom are persons who are part of us. They're from the diaspora. And we welcome them wholeheartedly. And we look forward to hearing from them later on. At this time, allow me to invite Dr. Elaine McCarthy to invite God's presence. Let's just stand for prayer. Most righteous and eternal Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the opportunity as a people to be gathered in this manner. And Lord, we ask your blessings upon this meeting this afternoon. Help, Lord, that even as questions and concerns will be raised, it will be done from a heart of love. It will be done from a space of oneness for the love of a nation that you have given to us. Father, we ask for your direction and your guidance as we discourse, as we seek, Lord, to lay matters on the table and to come to some consensus as the way to go. Bless those who will be participating, those who have taken time out to be here. We ask that you bless them. Above everything else, we ask that you bless Jamaica, a beautiful island that you have given to us. And so, Lord, we ask your direction in this meeting. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. McCarthy, chairman of the Umbrella Groups of Churches. At this time, I'd like to invite our custos, the Honorable Bishop Conrad Pitkin, to make his remarks. Custos, over to you. Thank you, Madam Master of Ceremonies. The Honorable Marlene Malahu, Fourth Minister of Legal and Constitutional Affairs, and chairman of the Constitution Reform Committee, members of the Constitution Reform Committee present and online, His Worship the Mayor of Montego Bay, Councillor Leroy Williams, Mr. Charles Sinclair, Senator and also Councillor of the St. James Municipal Corporation, Councillors, Justices of the Peace, P.S. Mr. Wayne Robertson, other members of the team, distinguished ladies and gentlemen present and online, members of the media, a pleasant good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. It is indeed a pleasure uh, to be here this afternoon at this town hall consultation meeting, the first of its kind in a series of town hall meetings to be held across Jamaica. Let me join with the master of ceremonies to welcome and acknowledge the members of the Constitutional Reform Committee present and online, especially those who are here, to our beautiful parish of St. James.
and in particularly to the city of Montego Bay. And it is my privilege to also bring remarks. To our distinguished guests, whether you are traveling a significant distance to be here this afternoon, or you're from this parish, or you've joined us virtually, it is my honor and privilege as Costas of this parish to welcome you on behalf of the citizens of St. James to this very important town hall meeting. Minister and your committee, there's no better place than Montego Bay, St. James, for you to host this first consultation session. Yes, let me hear it. And despite our challenges, the city of Montego Bay is still a destination of choice. Therefore, it is really wonderful, Minister, to have you and your committee visiting and sharing with us, although this may be a short one. And I wish to commend the minister and also the chairman of the committee for this initiative of bringing the committee to the people to get their views and input, not only to advance the work of the committee, but to ensure that all Jamaicans become a part of this constitutional reform. This is our constitution, ladies and gentlemen. It is therefore imperative that as a people, all of us become involved in dialogue so as to ensure that this process reflects the mind of all our citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, there is going to be a referendum where the people, the people will decide the way forward. There is only one way to accomplish that is through our civic duty to vote. In order to be a part of the, this decision-making process, we will have to enumerate to be able to participate in deciding the constitution that will govern our nation. So as Costas, the first citizen of St. James, I would love to implore our citizens to ensure that you're enumerated. So when the time comes to make the decision to decide the constitution to govern Jamaica, you will be a part of it. Minister Malahu Fort, I wish you and the committee every success in his deliberations. And may God bless you and God bless Jamaica land we love. Thank you. Thank you very much, Custer Spitkin. Now, this is a process and the process has started. It's a very important process and you heard the Custer say, enumerate to participate Sounds like a nice little jingle. Enumerate to participate. So that's how you're going to get involved. You know, the lady said she'd like to win the lottery. And her daughter says, but mommy, do you have a ticket? So if you don't have a ticket, you don't have a chance. So you need to enumerate to participate. And today forms the discussion for phase one of the constitutional process at Jamaica is about to embark on. Who better to give us the details and to share with us a little bit more on this process, but our honorable minister, and I'd like for you to put your hands together and make her welcome as she makes her remarks. Thank you, Madam Moderator. 
distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Honorable Costos, Senator Sinclair, Mayor, P.S., my fellow Constitutional Law Reform Committee members, as I'm about to say, my people, but I'll hold that. I'm so pleased to be here. I was wondering how do I say thank you to the Costas for welcoming me to St. James when St. James is my place. <laughs> you know, I may not be from St. James by birth, but I have staked a claim right here in St. James. And I wanted to remind the Costas that this is not the first consultation. It's the first consultation in this form of a town hall meeting. But those of you who came early witnessed something taking place. We did a little dethroning. So we had nice fancy chairs and we decided to leave the Costas sitting in the fancy chair because until the change is made, he represents the monarch down the line. <laughs> and the others of you who are sitting in the fancy chair, sit and enjoy it for now, because change is coming. Change is coming. A teacher that I respect has taught me that there is a difference between doubt and disbelief or unbelief. And he said, the best way to explain it is to look at it like this. Doubt asks the sincere questions. Unbelief won't hear the answers. So I want to find out who are the doubters and who are the unbelievers. Because we're going into question and answer. A lot of questions are being asked about this process. A lot of things have been said about the committee, described by some as elitists, described by some as hmm, elitists, elitists, elitists. But we are ordinary Jamaicans entrusted with important roles. All of us are important in this process. So you have heard that we are on the road to constitutional reform. And more particularly, we're on the road to the Republic of Jamaica. But people in St. James call Montego Bay the Republic. And so, they? Montego Bay is first at everything. Little wonder, this is the first place for this consultation. So you hear about the Constitution, and some of you may know what a Constitution is, and some of you may not know. But the Constitution is a collection of basic principles and procedures for the government of a state or for organizations. Those of you in service club know that you have a Constitution for the service club. In the case of the state, the Constitution is usually the supreme law with which all other laws must conform. Supreme law of the land, collection of the basic principles and procedure for the government of the state. And you hear government of the state because the state is different from the government. And the state sits above the government. All states have a formal head of state and a formal head of government. Some countries have the two offices in the same person. But for those countries who have their formal head of state and their formal head of government in the single office holder, they would have come through revolution and revolt for the most part. That's what the history book tells us. We are fortunate here in Jamaica to be going through constitutional reform not in times of war, not in times of external pressure, but by our own choosing. Because something was started 
about 60 years ago, and we have unfinished business. So what exactly is happening? The Constitution of Jamaica is the independence constitution. Jamaica as a British colony needed the approval of the imperial government of the United Kingdom to attain its independence and adopt a new constitution as its supreme law. Although the independence constitution which we have was drafted right here in Jamaica by our parliamentarians, the approval of the British government was necessary for the implementation of the new proposal. The English administration had to give its approval and an officer of Queen Elizabeth II had to sign the constitution order in council which brought the constitution of Jamaica in force. That's a little history. So the constitution was drafted here, it was considered here but it was brought into effect by an act in England. And so, the Constitution as our supreme law has set out a number of things that Parliament alone cannot change. Parliament is a body that makes the law. Those matters are set. I don't get to choose them, and you don't get to choose them at this time. So for those who are wondering whether the work being done is already done and we're coming to consult with the people as a show, not so, not so. We don't choose which matters the people have to vote on to change. As a matter of fact, the only time the people get to vote to pass a law is when a referendum is required. And you hear the referendum and you probably wonder what exactly is a referendum? It's simply a process by which you put a specific question to people who are registered to vote as to whether they agree or not with a proposal. And in this case, it's going to be a proposed law. Simple, simple. So when you hear referendum, don't, it's a simple thing. Simple in the sense of what it means, but it's a complex process. So I want to tell you that the issues on which the people have to vote to approve our set. And the work we are doing is building on the work done by others. It's far down the wicket. We have set an ambitious timeline. And people are saying, if you give a timeline that you want to bring a bill to the parliament, and we are here now, what can be done meaningfully? Is it a sham? We are in the age of technology. Just imagine how many people are present but not physically here. How many people we will be hearing from. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so pleased to tell you that this work to put a Jamaican as a head of our state is more than symbolic. It's more than symbolic. What we want to do is just the beginning of a whole set of other process. But if we don't make this first change, all the other things that you want will not come. We can want change. We can agree to it. We can say away with the British crown. The British crown, the presence of Britain in Jamaica is mixed up with the transatlantic slave trade. And with it, injustice and racism and so many other things. And as a new king is about to be crowned, the coronation is about to take place, an important constitutional event in England, we in Jamaica are also moving with an important constitutional event to sever King Charles III as our head of state and to establish the formal office of president for a new form of government in a republic. Republics are the alternatives to the monarchy. Plain and simple. Now we have designed this session to hear from you and to answer your questions. So it's not gonna be a lot of talk. 
we thought about coming down, those of you who were present, but then we encounter a little obstacle. As a matter of fact, there was a lesson to be learned, and I will take my seat because I'm anxious to hear from you. So we came in, and we saw the beautiful chairs, and we thank the organizers for putting them out. And when we looked on them, we thought, crownly, crownly, let us do something else and decrown them. So we did a little decrowning, and we brought them down. We say, let's come down on the level of the people, because the talk is that the committee, you know, is a little elitist group making decisions behind closed doors to foist on the people. So we say, let's come down here. You know, trying to respond to that suggestion. But we come down here and somebody around the back say, but we can't see you. And we want to see all of you. Then the next thing they say, but people are joining remotely. And if they come down here, the screen set up won't capture them. And I say, you see the level of confusion? If somebody don't take the lead and take a decision and be able to say why we take the decision, confusion will reign. It's plain and simple. So the committee is not here to dictate. Somebody had to organize the work. Having meetings privately doesn't equate to having meetings secretively. There's nothing secret about what we're doing. In fact, this kind of constitutional reform cannot be secret because at the end of the day, the people have to approve it and the people have to vote for it. So we've come to St. James and we chose some sharp square because history beckons right here in some sharp square. And as Sam Sharp said, I would rather die on yonder gallows than live in slavery. I hope that we understand that time come for us to move on. Ask your question, and when you ask the question, we will answer, acknowledging, and then we are going to action. Not, not cook up, we come to hear from you, but we have to tell you how the thing go. All right? So I'm looking forward to the questions. I have not yet told you the list of things that require referendum, and that's in the interest of time. Last thing I will say, that the change that we're seeking to make, if the parliament does not approve it first, there will be nothing to go to the people, because the change can only come with the passing of a law and the amendment of the Constitution. Ultimately, we want to write a new Constitution, but we're doing it step by step, stage by stage. And we've put the work in three stages. Stage one will focus on abolishing the constitutional monarchy as the form of government, establishing the Republic of Jamaica. Number of things flow from that. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for your opening comments. And as you indicated, it's about the people who are here today. We want to hear from you. There are microphones that are in your midst, and we just need for you to indicate. If you have a question, a comment, we're happy to take them. And of course, members of the committee are here. They are ready and willing to share with you as well to provide some answers. So all you need to do is to indicate by a show of hands. And when you come to ask your question, you may just say your name. And if you represent a particular group, organization, community group, doesn't matter. We want you to be involved. So there, there's a hand here and there are two hands in the middle. So we're going to start with my friend on the second row. There's a microphone. And we're going to encourage persons who are online to put their questions in the chat. We have several guests from the diaspora. Go ahead, sir. Yes. <clears throat> Greetings and blessings to the honorable guest. And give thanks for the opening from the prior. That's very touching. The open remarks from our costas and our honorable lady there. Give thanks. Now, two things. I don't want it to be too lengthy. What is it that wrong with independence that we see that we would be going to republic? Will be republic more proper 
for us as a people, and how will we view the indigenous people of Jamaica, such as the Rastafari nation and the Rastafari community, and how will we continue to address the issues which we all know what the Rastafari community has been through from the crown through the various areas of rejection of us identifying a sovereignty, which is Ethiopia crown. So how will we go forward in continuation with the input of the general public? Yes. Mr. Hilton would like to take that one. Yes, it's live. Go ahead. Thank you for the question. I think it, it asks the question, what really is a republic? And a republic is really an opportunity for a republic is a state. A republic is a state where the people are supreme, they elect their representatives, and they are able to shape and frame the constitution for that representative democracy. And it is different from an, a monarchy or a hereditary, meaning by you, you, you claim a right to govern by descendants. And it is what we have now, a hereditary monarchy that we seek to change to a democracy where the people themselves are supreme and they make and govern themselves through their constitution. So that's one form of it. On the question of the Rastafari as a group, as a people, it is one of the questions that have come up and it is for discussion about how we treat generally with indigenous persons. I don't know which of the group or which of the, the grouping that the Rastafari um, community would fall in, but it's a discussion to be had about indigenous people and who are those indigenous people. I will say to you, one of the things that you have said just now, that would see, what seems to me to be in some conflict with the Republic of Jamaica is the whole question of your loyalty to Ethiopia. So if you have divided loyalty, I think that is something that is going to be discussed and have to be properly understood as to how then you fit within the constitutional framework um, in Jamaica. But it's a point for discussion. Thank you very much. Remember to just say your name as you ask your question. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Claren Holness. Uh, representative of the West Green CDC. Um, there's a, a document, a, a charter in the Jamaican constitution, the fundamental right and freedom, which I absolutely love. So my question this evening is, can, can it be that we have that charter in this form in the new constitution. And I have an, well, uh, yeah, I would like that to be answered first. Oh, Clarence Holness. Okay, yeah, Clarence Holness. Yes, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Dr. Henry, go ahead. Mic check? Okay. All right, Clarence. Thank you for that question. And I, I, I'm just going to tr repeat so that I make sure I, I got the question correctly. You are appreciative of the Charter of Rights in the existing Constitution, and you are saying you'd like that to be a part of the new Constitution. I can say to you confidently that we would want to retain our Charter of Rights. It has gone through a process to this point where it has been included, which is fairly recently it has been included as a part of our constitutional arrangement. However, in the overall process of review, 
and reform, we want to look back at the charter and see as well, are there other rights that we may want to include? But for sure, I believe I'm not speaking out of turn when I say that what exists now, we want to retain, but we want to review it and perhaps even expand it into other areas. Okay? Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And please stand. The gentleman in the wheelchair had a question as well. Yeah. Um, Tony, go ahead. And then we'll uh, come to you, sir. I'm citizen 1.5 million. That's my name. Here's my question. Um, one of the present problems we have in this government system is not the, the queen necessarily. It's the fact that after we elect members of parliament, right, everybody above there, everybody who governs our country is appointed. Everybody. Even the prime minister. We don't elect him. Appoint. Boom. Thank God, we don't have some ging bang football players wanting to rule, like in some countries. But everybody, after we put our vote on an MP, whosoever he be in this system, is appointed under one method or another. There is the problem. The queen. I don't even know if she care, but who represent her, him get or she get appointed. Now, we are going through a whole lot of strain here to set up another higher appointed smuddy on top there. Because really, what this country really need is government by the people. Even this body here, revered as salutes, appointed people. There has to be a better way. Furthermore, referendum. All we are doing, in fact, right, is being afraid of a referendum that will take the power away from the two parties. And it's based on something I have not heard in the news. In the 1960s, the last referendum was held on the issue of, no, federation. But somehow, and our pundits are not mentioning it, it came out that the people voted for independence. Please, you know, all like that. On the most member, and there are journalists who should be saying that right now. The last referendum that we had ended up taking the will of the people and abusing it. You turn me off? No, you're on. I'm Mr. telling Thompson. you, we have a problem. And we are going. And we are going back there. And Do you have a why. question? Do you have a question though, Mr. Thompson? Yeah, the question is yes. why are we going back to that system? Why are we taking six weeks? Not a brochure bill for this occasion. This one pop up out of the hat in response. And why are we saying six weeks for a constitution, anything, when it took us two years to do the, the, the constitution of the road, the traffic act? Excuse me, please. This is, a, this is a real shop. We need real power to the people. Not this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Minister, would you like to respond? Dr. Thompson, you've raised some valid points. Where the power rests. So, Jamaica is a democracy. And it's true that we have a lot of problems. And I think you've gone to the heart of the issue. When we make this change, what are we going to put in place? Those who went before this committee, who looked at the work and spent years assessing it, what we got at independence, where we are now, recommend, made a recommendation. The committee 
decided, the approach taken by the government is to look at those re recommendations of the past, not just to pick them up and implement them, but to consider with the passage of time between then, 1995, when the report with the recommendations went to Parliament and now in 2003, what else we need to take into account? What perspectives? Do people feel the same way about the change? So what are the two forms that you can have for your head of state? You can have an executive head of state that is voted directly by the people. And in that case, the head of state is also the head of your government. And you can have a non-executive that can be a put in place by a number of different processes. Well, well, you put, those who vote for me put me in place by the process of voting. So I use that term widely because it covers a number of things. Right. So let me ask you, as much as we have problems in Jamaica, do you agree that Jamaica has had a stable democracy? You don't agree. You personally don't. What about others? Stability in our democracy. You're saying no democracy at all. It's not quite so. I mean, the problems are real, but we are a democracy. We are. So the question is, in the, the head of state is King Charles. Who identify with King Charles here? King Charles is represented by the governor general. And although King Charles really doesn't business with the governor general, we have to pay to support the governor general. The question is, do we continue to have our head of state as a representative of a foreign monarch? Two options, essentially. You vote directly or you take another process. What we have considered for your consideration, not throwing it out on you, not throwing it out on you, that the essence of a democracy is competitive politics. If you don't have competition in the politics, you don't have democracy. And there are some things that you need to put above the competitive politics, at least the way we have practiced it. State responsibility exists whether PNP form government, JLP form government, or any other party that come along the way. And some things must be placed above the party politics. And that's why, having looked at the recommendation, we thought it's not a bad idea. In fact, if we don't make the change, we may never know what else needs to be done. It doesn't have to be the last stop. It is just the starting point of making the change from the monarch as our head of state. So we will have to consider, of course, do Jamaicans want an elected head of state? You look at the US and you see what happened there. And many who I've spoken with say, we look in the US and we see them elected and we want it elected too. But there is a whole system that come it will require the uprooting of our structure. And even if we agree that it should be uprooted, do we do it all at once? Or do we take it in stages? And that's all we're saying, in stages. Because if we do it all at once, the displacement is going to be so great. The displacement is going to be so great. You can tell me if you can live in a country where everything mash down and pop up and it's done all at once. We are here to listen. I am here to listen. That's all I can say. Can, so, I, can I comment? Yes. I, I think the question you have asked, sir, is very penetrating. And it's a very important question that we all have to respond to. The first part of what you shared was that there is a sense in which persons who are leading us are really appointed. Did I get it right? And there's a sense in which they are not elected by the people. For example, our prime minister, we could argue, is not really elected by the people, right? He's put, appointed by his party, the head of the party. And that's a consideration that I think we all will have to take into account in this process of constitutional reform. Should we elect directly our prime minister, for instance? Should we elect directly our senators who presently are appointed? Those are relevant questions for our consideration because... Republic, re, and the word public, it is speaking about governance by the people, the supremacy of the people, and we need to really explore very carefully 
how best can we do that? And if what we have now, it's a democracy, but can our democracy be improved? So I'm just taking on board what you're saying, so because I think it's a very, very important comment that you have made. And if I can add Thank you very much. Uh, Nadine? Yes, but we're not hearing you. We're not hearing you. Okay. Dr. If I could add to that, I think one of the things I like to think about as a Jamaican is that the process of making a nation isn't one that happens at one time. That one of the things we do is that incrementally or revolutionary, over time, we are always improving the quality of our democracy. As we go ahead and as we learn more, we decide how we make this improvement happen. And I think the only thing that, is, <clears throat> that could be a danger to that process is if citizens become too cynical to be a part of it or if they check out. So this, this is the classic case of a democracy where citizens are sitting down and are mulling over and are talking about the kind of state that they want, the kind of government that they want. This is a classic case of how a democracy works. So we have to recognize that even though we haven't, and no society has evolved a perfect democracy, every society is a work, every democracy is a work in progress. Each generation adds to the quality of the democracy. And the generation after that is expected to improve it. You said 1962, a decision was made. So in 2023, and even before 2023, different generations of Jamaicans have added to the not to that discourse of what is this Jamaican state. And we are allowed to quarrel over it. We don't want to physically fight over it. But this, it is worth our passion and our time. So let us discuss it. That is it. We are not going to throw our hands up in frustration. And we won't all agree because it's a democracy. A democracy means that we, we don't all have to agree. But we are going to work with the consensus. We are going to work with the majority view. Right? But the idea is that we are all working it out. This is what a democracy is about. So I think the democracy, as flawed as it is, the concept of democracy, not just the Jamaican practice of democracy, but as flawed as that concept is, until we evolve a better model, it's what we are working with. And the fact that we are doing this, for me, is clear indication that our democracy is healthy and thriving. Thank you, Dr. Spence. We're going to move to the gentleman in the wheelchair, and then we're going to take a question online right after that. Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, all protocol in, um, observe. Um, my, my name is Andrew East, and I'm president of the uh, Cornwall Combined Disability Association Benevolent Society. We're not hearing you very well. I'm going to ask you to... Hello. Oh, <laughs> All right, um, my name is Andrew and I represent the Connor Combined Disability Association as president currently. Um, uh, my question, um, I can understand the gentleman's term and he actually forced uh, um, answer to part of my question, which, was, which is good. Um, and we can understand the disenchantment that we, we can feel um, as citizens seeing a lot of stuff start and stop along the way. So my, um, one of my other questions was, um, why are we just getting here after 60, 60, 60 odd years? Why? Why are we just here? We should have, been, we should have um, passed here a long time ago. And when we have appointed a president, what is, what is it that governs his actions and choices? How, how do we go forward and what, what governs him? Dr. Spence, we're not hearing you on that microphone. I would say, yeah, the president is his or her. So you say his, I'm just, I just adding to that. But it's the constitution that you are going to help us to craft that will do that. It's the constitution that all our voices will be heard in, or as much of us as possible that will do that. It is because we have this robust democracy that we can sit with you and ask, what do you think? And how do you think we should elect our president? And what are the mechanisms we put in place to ensure that the, 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 the president delivers on what we want? Um, so, I, I mean, that's my take on it. I don't know if anybody else on the committee has. I think we have to decide how do we 
put in place mechanisms to ensure that the people who we elect deliver on what we want them to deliver. Six, how have we got, just got here? I think perhaps other people can, there's a process, there's a constitutional process that might explain why we took so long. Um, but I, my own feeling is that there's, there are a number of things that we liked about the previous arrangements. Um, and there are a number of things that we didn't like. I don't think we've got to a point where we are so disenchanted with it that we really want it to go. I think when we really want the, the current arrangement to go, when we are tired of the British monarchy and we decide that we want to be our own sovereign, I think it will happen. I hope that it is this time. I hope that it is now that all Jamaicans or most Jamaicans feel that it is time to end this relationship with the British monarchy, to end the, the relationship that originally began as beautifully captured in these paintings on, this, on these walls. I hope that we are at the point that we are really willing to end it. But unless the Jamaican people are ready to do so, we won't get to a point when we truly end it. Thank you, Dr. Spence. I'm going to take a question from Dr. Karen Dunkley, who is from the diaspora. I believe she's online, Dr. Dunkley. Thank you so much, Madam Moderator. All protocols observed. Good afternoon to all the distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for having me in such a critical conversation. I have a two-part question, especially based on the context set forth by the Honorable Minister Malahu Fort, very helpful context, and much of the questions and the response from the esteemed Constitutional Reform Committee. My question is, specifically, we are engaged in consultation panels as opposed to plenary. And I understand that we can use either model based on the stage of consultation that we are at. So what exact stage are we in? In other words, how can this process of reform engage us in meaningful public participation? I know we have this panel, but I'm talking about how exactly do we get to inform the list of items specifically that will go forward for the referendum? For example, whether or not we want as a community the direct election of the prime minister, what is the role of the president, the treatment of indigenous people? How do we get our ideas forward in the process? So when we get these lists of items, it will have the informed consensus from a diverse group of stakeholders, including members of the global diaspora, while safeguarding our nation's core democratic values and principles. That's my first question. The second part of that is, what is the plan to replicate the process of consultations taking place in Jamaica right now in the global diaspora? Because we recognize that even the little pitney in our primary school have to be engaged in this process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dunkley. Um, who will we have take question one, question two? Okay. So the, the question that you ask doc, is Dr. Dunkley. Dr. Dunkley. Relates yes. to the matter of uh, public engagement. And one of the first committees, well, the only committee so far to be established on the Constitutional Reform Committee process is the Public Engagement and Communication Committee. And one of, the, uh, one of our, our responsibilities is to ensure that we are engaging Jamaicans on the matters before the committee, one, but also that Jamaicans are able to say, this is what I would prefer. And so one of, the thing, one of our um, mechanisms to facilitate that is an email account that we have, and we're encouraging Jamaicans, including you in the room, if you have suggestions, if you, have, you, know, if you want to think through your ideas a little bit more, if you want to present like a one page or a two page saying this is who I am and this is what I'd like to see. You can do that to our email address. We also have a, a WhatsApp number. I don't have them offhand, but I know we can give them to you soon enough that we can use to, um, to, to direct our ideas and to also raise concerns about the content or the process of the reform. So that's one. The, and as well that 
this process of consultation begins in St. James, begins in Montego Bay. Although last week we had a consultation with the press. And it is an iterative process. It, the numbers of people that we are seeking to engage expands every time we meet a group of people. Um, and we are going to be having town halls, but it's not just town halls or consultations like this one that we'll have. We'll have focus group discussions. We'll have, you know, just general conversations. We'll lime, we'll chat. We won't have a reason with Jamaicans on the matter of the Constitution. Um, the, the diaspora, of course, we've thought through the diaspora. In fact, um, Sujay has already had a consultation with the minister, with the youth in the diaspora. And I have, you know, been on a, a radio program um, facilitated by a Jamaican in the diaspora where members of the diaspora fielded questions and I was able to answer as it relates to matters related to the constitution. And we will seek to deepen that engagement with the diaspora so that members... Uh, uh, Jamaicans who live abroad can continue to make their impact. But I know that um, the distance between us will not separate the quality of the engagement. And so, Karen, if you have ideas that you want to share, if you have a group of people that you want to, us to meet with via Zoom, if you want to share a paper, if you want to send ideas, if you want to be included in our WhatsApp group and the sharing of ideas through that mechanism, then please ensure that before you leave this consultation. Today we have your contact information so we can continue the conversation with you. To add, the WhatsApp number is 876-441-9097. 876-441-9097. And we are on all of the social media um, platform. 876-441-9097. And right. our handle, it's MLCA. Well, that's our website. MLCA, Ministry, Legal, Constitutional Affairs, dot gov, dot jm. And then for Facebook, and Instagram and Twitter, it's at MLCA GOVJM. Work is organized in a certain way. But here we are. So all of the forms of media available will be used, not just face to face meeting like this, small. We have had a number of small group meetings where people have been in person and have joined online. We have had them in the night into the wee hours of the morning. We have had early morning. We have gone out. We have sat one-on-one -on -one with some group. We have done off the record. So various form. You name it, in this day and age, we are utilizing it. And in fact, the benefit of this age is that things move at a much faster pace. And we record what you say. We take into account what you say. So the question Earlier question raised yes, a number of issues. question one, issue. I believe, yes. is still unanswered. It, it raised a number of issues about what it is that we will be focusing on. Can you remind me, um, the question was about... The question, well, go ahead, Dr. Dunkley. Just pick yeah. out those pieces relating to the role of the president and other ah, areas that you, you mentioned. That's right. Thank you. So, we're not hearing you, we're Dr. We're not Dunkley, hearing you, Dr. Dunkley. But while your audio comes on, for, for this part of the consultation. Let me break it down into some small items. We are Jamaicanizing the Constitution. Simply, mm -hmm. what that means is that we want the Constitution to be passed by the Parliament of Jamaica, approved by the people of Jamaica. Because what we have was not approved by the people of Jamaica, and it didn't come into effect by the Parliament of Jamaica. And the Parliament is the place where laws are passed. That's the first thing. The second thing that we want to do is to abolish the monarchy that is in the Constitution as our form of government. And we would establish the republic. We would establish a new office. These are the things we are consulting on because there are specific items that the people have to approve. For the office of president is how do we select, how do we put in place the new president? And I know many people have a lot of views on this. 
then what type of presidency? The executive president or the non-executive? Or a hybrid, something in between, where you give important executive power to the president while you still have a separate head of government that comes through your election process. The other thing is a term of the presidency. Um, how long should a president be in office for? Should, there, should it be a renewable term? Should it span the life of the parliament, one life of the parliament into the next? And most importantly, what powers do we give the president? Because a republic essentially is about how we distribute power in the system. So these are the issues that are primarily in phase one. Remember I say, we don't determine what it is mm -hmm. that go to the people for their approval in a referendum. That is already set in the constitution. I can't undo it now. So what we have to do is to merely tell you what it is and then we discuss those topics. And since we're doing the work in phases, we're taking those matters that if we don't change them, all of the other change. So, Mr. Thompson, you want the whole system to vote everybody in? If we don't make this change, we'll never get to there. So, we may, at this time, not have consensus on what that should look like. But in order to even get to there for consideration, we have to make these first changes. I believe Mr. Hilton wants to add something to that question or to that answer? Yes, you may use my microphone. Can you hear me? Yeah, um, firstly, let me say that in direct response to the question raised by the member from the global diaspora is that members of the committee believe some members of the committee believe that a subcommittee of the, of the committee along the lines of the communication subcommittee should be established to address, to interact with the diaspora um, because there are substantial questions and issues concerning a very important part of our, our, our people, you know, the part of Jamaica and how we can get them to engage even more than they do now, which is primarily around economic um, and other kinds of contribution. A number of them have been arguing for um, closer involvement in and contribution to not just the economy, but the social and political life of the country. So we believe there are some important questions there to be answered, and their engagement in that pro this process is very important as well. Now let me address another issue that arises from what um, the member just asked, Dr. 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 Dunkley just asked. So I, we believe that in the opposition that there is some logic to what the government has structured in terms of um, deeply entrenched provision and addressing those. However, and, and, so, and, and therefore the question of Jamaicanization of the Constitution is one that we believe is important. However, we also believe that the issue of decolonization of our Constitution is very, very important, very critical. It is the case that the deeply entrenched provisions of the Constitution require a referendum. But you should know that in structuring the Constitution, as they did, the framers of the Constitution had considered some other matters that are worthy of inclusion in the Constitution, but anticipated that we would make early changes in the Constitution, and so did not deeply entrench them in the Constitution. So they are not deeply entrenched provisions. They do not require... A, a referendum, but they're nevertheless fundamental to the structure and operation of our Constitution. One such very critical issue is our court, final court of appeal and the role for the Privy Council. Very fundamental. That is not a deeply entrenched provision, 
does not require a constitutional a, 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 a referendum. And so the question is, how do we how do we represent that understanding its fundamental role in the structures of our constitution? And is that a question for second stage or third stage, or is that a question that should be part of the fundamental framework of the Constitution going forward? These are some of the questions we continue to discuss, and we have a, um, a debate, robust debate, in the committee and, and in, the, and in this, the society. We are interested not in, in having consensus within the, co the, the committee, but we are, even more importantly, we want to hear the consensus among the people themselves. On this, another question. The related matter for Jamaicans living overseas is who qualifies to sit in our parliament. And that is an issue also to make a change would require a referendum. And we have been having a robust debate. Who are Jamaicans? And I just share with you some of what we discussed internally, hearing, you know, the talk of the people. So we're a small nation. Internationally, I tell people by virtue of Jamaica's size and the population size, describe us as a rare breed. There aren't many of us. So we have some on the island and others off the island. But, uh, so we see Jamaica as a global community with its citizens living here in Jamaica and overseas. The constitution we got from Britain, the citizenship qualification for parliament is Commonwealth citizen. All right? Not Jamaican citizen, Commonwealth citizen. And we say many countries have moved away from that. And the citizenship criteria is the citizen of the country itself. So part of Jamaicanizing it is to make the cit a citizenship in Jamaica to be the citizenship that qualifies you to sit in, in the parliament and to hold the, import, the, the offices. But the next question that arises, what do we do with Jamaicans who have other citizenship? And in particular, Jamaicans who live in the U.S. And the U.S. is not part of the Commonwealth. Because currently now, those dual citizens sworn allegiance to a foreign power would not qualify if we keep the definition of Commonwealth as it is. Because anything outside of the Commonwealth is a foreign. But the truth is, anything outside of Jamaica is foreign. But to even make that change requires the people to approve it. And we're saying um, this, is, this, is, this issue really um, got us going. Do we disqualify our Jamaicans who went abroad for better at the time when the economy was in turmoil, broken, stagnating, and then their children born abroad not doing any act of their own, no choice of their own, but are deeply connected to Jamaica, come back and live in Jamaica. So there are a lot of things, a lot of things. So let me tell you what the Constitution say about which matters require a referendum to change in its structure. First of all, the entire process to change the Constitution if we're going to change how the Constitution is changed, the people have to approve that change. We have a complex process, but there are different types of provision in the Constitution with the different methods to change them. So the simplest provision, what we call the ordinary provision, all you require is a vote of the majority of all the members of parliament. Absolute majority of both houses, not just those who are present and voting. And then we have the entrenched provisions. To change that, you require two-thirds vote in both houses. Now, as a parliament is structured, the government have the two-thirds vote because the Jamaica Labour Party has a large majority now, amounting to more than two-thirds of the total number. But you can't get two-thirds in the Senate if you don't get an opposition vote. And then we have the deeply entrenched provisions have the highest level of protection for those provisions, even if the two sides in parliament agree, because you need a two-thirds vote and you can't get it without the opposition um, voting along. The people will have to vote to approve it, the people who are registered to vote, because that's what a democracy is. So we have 
a set list of matters in the Constitution that if you're changing them, you have to go to the people. One is a process by which the Constitution itself is changed. So all are you wondering, why are we going through this? Why are we holding referendum? Barbados made a change and they didn't have to do it. Different thing over there. Right here, we have to go through that process. It is long, it is tedious, but there is no getting around it if we want to make the fundamental changes. And then it's the establishment of the parliament, which consists of His Majesty, no King Charles III, the Senate and the House of Representatives. The other one is how the Senate is made up. 21 senators, 13 appointed by the Governor General on the advice of the Prime Minister, eight on the advice of the Leader of the Opposition. The, the other one is who qualifies to sit in the House of Represent, Representatives. And that question has to do also with um, how you are elected and the process of it. And the next one is a broader question of qualification for membership in both houses of parliament. Subject to disqualification provisions, Commonwealth citizenship, age over 21, and being ordinarily resident in Jamaica for at least 12 months preceding your nomination. And then we have the session of parliament, right? How long the parliament can be on break from one session to the next? Maximum of six months can't go over that, we get into a constitutional problem. The other thing has to do with the life of the parliament at five years. If we have to change that, the people have to vote for that. Then we have the extension of the life of the parliament. So we just came out of a pandemic. Elections were held six months before the constitutional life of the parliament um, ended. The reason why that happened is because if we got to the end of the life of the parliament and another wave of the pandemic and new variants hit, we would have been in a constitutional crisis. There is no provision other than wartime provisions for the holding over of the life of the parliament. And with the lessons from COVID, we know that other calamities are likely to strike and we have to make a provision for that. A lot of other questions flow from it. Then powers exercisable by the Governor General about dissolving the Parliament and when there is a vote of no confidence. And also the appointment of Senators soon after an election is held to ensure that both Houses of Parliament are fully constituted. Where the Executive Authority of Jamaica is, and it says that the Executive Authority is vested in His Majesty succeeding Her Majesty the Queen. And, la, and the other two things relate to how the Constitution interpretation matters and then provisions of the Jamaica Independence Act when we gain um, independence. So all of you who are wondering, boy, something must cook up, you know, because it cannot be that you say you want to change the Constitution and you give a timeline for a bill and that timeline... I'm listening to the feedback. Soon come to talk about that. And then you have to hear from the people how much can be done between now and then. I think that is real. the real distrust is. People don't believe government. They don't believe people. Mr. Thompson, you say people get elected and then you don't see them. We have some serious problems in the country around governance. None of us in government can stand up and say there aren't concerns. Many people feel undone by government. They feel that the bureaucracy has not served them well. Some even say that some people in government represent the old slave masters. And so we need to bust up the system and change it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't begin with that change of abolishing the monarch as our head of state, all of the other very important things that we need to work out, they will not come. Bottom line. So when you hear that a bill has been drafted, the bill to go to Parliament has not yet been drafted, but we do have bills. And by bill, we mean the document that becomes law that goes through the Parliament for passing. It is because so many other people before us did a lot of work. They spent so much time consulting with the people, and we still didn't get it done. The nearest thing that was done was in 2011 with the new charter. Revolutionary. 
but that's just as big as it was in the scheme of things it's a small part of the work so right now you ask the question what's happening now well the truth is you know queen elizabeth whom we inherited when jamaica became an independent country has transitioned and king charles her son has replaced him jamaican had not a say in that some people felt an affection towards queen elizabeth others say they have no attachment to king charles so something is happening over there but it's also because this is work that was started a long time ago and there is never a right time to do it because some say you got to do it when you're just coming in power because everybody's going to be occupied some say government freed a referendum because of the experience with federation ladies and gentlemen if we don't start in earnest to get it done and if we don't take the step to get it done people will come after us and we would have the same fate as those who went before us so don't worry about the timeline that is indicated because we will have to make an assessment of what you say on the issues that we will have to put to the people for their approval and we come to listen because your views matter and your voice matter thank you very much minister i believe mr boswell who is our youth advisor wanted to make a comment i'm going to allow you to go ahead at this time good evening everyone now if you look around the room you will see a fundamental issue just take a brief glance across the room what's up sir young people i come from right up the road in glendavon and norwood that's where i'm from and one of the things i'm commonly hearing is a sudden thing set and that transcends from just the issues of crime but also across government because many young people have lost trust in the processes we can't wrong them no i heard the gentleman who spoke about indigenous people and the rest of here and it's a pity he's not here because we have to engage those young people who are from the rest of our faith because guess what we will be the ones who will have to leave and live in a society based on what we decide today if you look at what happens young people make up majority of the population no and so we have to be deliberate in how we engage because again as we move forward as a society we cannot do it without young people i heard the question on how do we engage and why no is it the same as other things that mentality that has affected us in different ways we have accepted that our head of state is the monarch and we are okay in many regards with a jamaican being his representative we're okay with the fact that we as jamaican taxpayers are funding the head of state's representative the head of state being the king of england a white man who may never visit the country we have to shake up the system and i'm encouraging all youth who may be hearing my voice whether they be outside whether they're inside because as things are now we have to rethink and reimagine the jamaican society that we want to live now i heard dr dunkley online as well and i've been listening intently dr dunkley asked a question how do we feed into the process and it's a very important question dr spence would have spoken to the different avenues and channels that are available we so far met with the global jamaica diaspora youth council and that was a preliminary engagement and coming out of that engagement they've asked for more meetings which means that even though there are young people who say as other things said there are those who want information there are those who want to be engaged those who want to give their suggestions but it has to be a collective it has to be a collective will so I answer your question why are we here it is a matter of will it is a matter of political will in the past because these issues did not just start yesterday these conversations did not start yesterday as minister would have spoken earlier what we're doing now is that we're reviewing things that would have been discussed there's a report from 1995 that we were reviewing what we have to do is to have the will and the ability to see beyond the immediate because these issues where we talk about civics 
We have to think about what it means to be a Jamaican. What does it mean as an individual to be living in a Jamaican society? That is what we're defining in this process. So it starts with phase one. And phase one is very particular about Jamaicanizing the Constitution, making it ours so that we can be proud that the head of our country is one of ours, not a representative of somebody else. The fact we fund the head of state as representative. So we pay to have somebody from the UK represent us in the country. I saw the thing said, that don't work for me. We have to have some form of change. Now, as we embark on the consultations, I got a message from a young lady who's a youth parliamentarian. And she represents indigenous people in the youth parliament. And she said to me, I want to meet with you because our young people need to be heard. And I'm saying it here that this first official town hall consultation, it cannot be the last and it won't be the last. But this cannot be the only consultation that happens in St. James. We have to go into the communities and engage the community members because, again, we, the committee members, aren't singular voices. And I don't think that I'm a singular voice for young, for young people of Jamaica. And so we have to be in the communities to hear. And I am going to make this uh, minister, I'm going to use some privilege, to invite ourselves to your communities. We want to hear, we want to engage, because this is our constitution, it's not the CRC's constitution. It is a Jamaican constitution, and in Jamaicanizing it, there can be no elitism in the process. And my fellow colleagues don't see that as something that we want, any form of elitism. So we have to work together. We have to have the collective will. We have to have the collective belief that better can come. And we have to hold our leaders accountable in the process to get better. That cannot be absent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Boswell. I'm going to allow Dr. Elaine McCarthy to make a comment at this time. And then we're going to take the gentleman in the back who is pretty close to the camera in black. So Dr. McCarthy, over to you. Thank you very much. Now, as I sat here and um, looking at the process that we are engaged in, it's one which is going to require, require of us a will to change. We need to stop at this point and take stock of ourselves. How do we view ourselves as a people at this point in time? The other question I'd like to ask is, do we have the self-will and the desire to acknowledge that we are at a state where we can handle our own governance? We have to ask ourselves these questions. I know change is something that we try to avoid as human beings. But in order for us to move to the next level, we will have to confront change. We will have to decide within our minds that this is what I want to do. I'm going to take a step of faith, as it were. And I know that based on past experiences, we have had past experiences that we can use to build on in order to move forward. But we will have to have that mind of coming together and wanting to do this thing and believing in ourselves that we can do it. After 60 years, we have had enough experiences that we can pull on and use those to move forward, to become truly independent, where we make our own laws and have a say in the things that we do instead of having to get the approval elsewhere. So I just want for us to, you know, be mindful of this fact that we need to push forward and this is the time. And as was mentioned in our meeting today, this is not coming out of a situation where there is war and so we are being pushed into this kind of um, thinking. But it's one in which we are sitting like this and talking. And as Dr. Spencer says, it, it's a prime example that democracy is alive and well. We are a strong nation. And we have a deep desire to see the best for Jamaica. And so I want for all of us to really look at what is happening. Make sure that you have an input 
in all that is being said. There are various social media platforms that has been opened up and the church itself of which I am a representative, we are going to be getting out there. We have actually started already and there are other meetings like these that we will be having so that everybody at the end of the day will be informed as to what you're asked to vote on. We need to ensure that we know what it is so that when it comes to the time for us to vote, then we are able to do so. We have a will. We are a strong nation. When we look at our um, heroes, even where we are today, Sam Sharp Square, and the man that represents the square, you can see the will to change things and not sit around and accept what was handed down because there is better for the beautiful island of Jamaica. That's what I just like to say at this time. Thank you very much, Dr. McCarthy. I'd like to hear from the gentleman in the back and then I'll go to Mr. Hilton and my friend in the orange. We're going to take it in that order. Mr. Reed, we're going to come right back to you and we're going to just move swiftly around the room. Bear with us. We have several hands. Let's go with the gentleman who's standing with the microphone first. Hello, good evening. My name is E Central. Good evening, committee members. Good evening, Chair, Madam Chair. <laughs> well, so far, we're fine. We have the Parliament stream live. We have the Senate stream live. We have the Public Committee stream live. We have the bail bill stream lab. We have 24 clause and four schedules. As important as this meeting, meeting, is it possible to have a live, live stream sittings going on from here back then? Live stream of the meetings of the committee? Yes, please. We're considering it. So, I said before, there is no, nothing to hide. When you're starting a work, you have to get to understand. Many of you who sit in management position, leadership position, or even in your house, you can't start in the public right away, no. You have to sort out the work, all right? But there is nothing to hide. We're going to make available the records of the meeting because we are, docu we are archiving them. It's an important historic time. We are going to, once we're, go we're take considering how and when we release the minutes of the meeting for those who would like to see. So that one issue is what I hear a lot of people say. They want to get a, a bird's eye view into the room when we are discussing the matter. I think we are at that stage where we can open the committee because we have to focus the attention of the nation now on the phase one. And then we have to make a decision in light of what you say, at what pace we go forward. So so the issues that we will be discussing, and you're going to hear me repeat it, so you can go back and repeat it. It's the abolition of the monarchy. If you could permit me, is there anyone in this room who feels that we should keep the monarch as our form of government? Quick show of hand. Is that Wayne? Wayne White? You're a monarchist. Well, democracy is alive and well. We can't hear you without the view. Not right now. So how many hands? Let me see how many hands. Two hands. Three hands. Three. All right. So let me do the reverse now. Who in the room would say, go ahead abolishing the monarch as our form of government? Let's see the raise of hands. We Some. have to see. And those who haven't raised your hands. Some are abstaining. <laughs> what happened? You're not sure yet. But from the show... Those who have spoken, we're talking about those who have spoken. It is the majority that say abolish. Remember I tell you about doubt and unbelief? If you are doubtful at this time, ask the question. Seek the answer. <laughs> but don't be an unbeliever. When you get the answer, you don't want it. Or you don't want the answer at all. Alright? So, phase one. What kind of president? What kind of president for the Republic. All right? What powers are we going to give the president? What term of office? What will be the process by which we put the president in place? These are the matters that I really want to hear you talk about. 
I also want to hear about the other issues, you know. But because the work is phased, we will come back on the other issues, even as we are prepared to hear from you what else you want to talk about. Because we didn't set the list. We have to follow the Constitution about the things that we have to engage the people on. Thank you, Minister. I believe we have Mr. Norman Reed, who has a microphone in hand. No, Norman Reed. So my question is the other issue. Will you be visiting a compound? What is your plan to engage the Maroon community? And what is the game plan to bring them on board? Thank you very much. At the end of this process that is taking place in phases, we want to write a new constitution for the people of Jamaica. And I think we have to engage all of the people of Jamaica. Our motto, out of many one people, is still an aspiration. It's still an aspiration. Meaning, we have a whole lot of life to breathe into it. Minister, just one moment. To make it a reality. One moment, please. I'm going to ask us to just be attentive, because I know some persons are having a little difficulty hearing. So I need your undivided attention, please. Thank you very much. Thanks, Minister. We're going to move to the next person. Can I ask Mr. Reed if he would arrange a, con a meeting in Maroon? Okay. <laughs> I was just asking because you raised the concern. You see, me throw it back in your court, Mr. Reed, and you, th you throw it back to me. But as I said before, we are ready to hear every perspective. And so, of course, the Maroon perspective is an important one. Thank you. Can I tell you a quick joke? So somebody said to me early in the form, you know, minister, to really Jamaicanize the constitution, don't adopt any of the Western titles. Jamaica, no problem, man. The head of state's title should be his or her iriness, I and I. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> there are so many views out there. But we want to hear from everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. The gentleman in the back who has the microphone, please go ahead. Mr. Cunningham. Lance Cunningham here. In light of what you recognize, Mr. Youth, man, uh, the absence of youth within the audience here, I am asking the question whether or not you're going to be taking these consultations to to high schools, colleges, and universities to get the inputs from the, the youths, given the fact that there might be several reasons why we're not having them in these consultation, probably where they live, maybe financial strains in coming to these, these parts of the, the city. So um, this is something that we need to consider, you know, taking it to the schools and, and colleges. Great, great question, sir. And the short answer to that is yes. Because not only do we need to engage them, but there's a sense in which, even as we look at the demographic in our nation, there's a, a, a high level of ignorance of our constitution. That's the reality. And I'm not cussing anybody about that. It's just the reality. And there are generations, because we don't teach ethics in school anymore, for instance. So we need to engage, a part of our mandate is to facilitate public education. That needs to happen through the ministry and to happen particularly with, the, with that demographic of which you just referred. Very, very important. They need to understand it and also they need to be able to speak back to us because I believe we have brilliant young people who have ideas which they will need to share with us and we want to hear it. Thank you very much, the Dr. The process Henry. doesn't stop when the bill goes to Parliament, by the way. The Constitution says, before you can even start the debate on the bill, three months must pass. When the bill gets tabled in the Parliament, there has to be a three-month timeline before you start the debate. That rule doesn't exist generally, only specifically in relation to the entrenched and deeply entrenched provisions. So once we give you the signal, once you say time, come, and we have to do the thing. The process will not stop. 
because we have to ensure that everybody knows. And the process to educate the people about the Constitution is one that's going to take about a decade. So we can't even... One suggestion was to put the whole Constitution to the people, a, a drafting proposal. And somebody said to me, but the people don't even know what's in the Constitution yet. So we have to do it in bite sizes. In bite sizes, so that you don't choke. We can't sue. You know what them say? You bite off more than you can swallow. You choke. So... There's a little logic to it. It's not about not wanting to do it. It's a recognition that so much needs to be done, but we have to start somewhere to do it. Thank you, Minister. Who is our next person? There's someone right down front. And I believe we have a question online as well. Go ahead, sir, and then we're going to ask you to pass the microphone to Mr. Joe Hilton, who is sitting on the second row. Good evening to the panels. And good evening to... House of Parliament, Minister, Miss Muller and Ford, and all the guests in the audience. Well, I have a very imperative question that I need to address. The young man over there would have said something why in the audience you don't have a lot of young folks, young people, your dialogue with what's going on. For one, the young people, we fell like there is so many hypocrisy going on for one this independence we've been heard that our country has been independent since 1962 and when we look at the word independence it means free from outside control that means we don't honor another jurisdiction of another authority but now we are striving and moving forward for a republic jamaica so my question is this. We are not independent, so we are striving now to true independence. Republic, the people's government. What is there to ensure us that when we become fully republic, achieve the goal that we are trying now to achieve, when we make the choice to give all these elective people a chance to bring about a change so we have now a republic Jamaica, what would be the task for the people? What will be what's the question? What will be the Okay, let me say this, rephrase myself again. Just give us the question They said we are independent we find out that we are not independent because we realize the word, the adjective of independent this means free from control Yes, and we got all of that. We just didn't hear the question that you asked. Okay, and I'm saying we are striving to a republic, Jamaica. That means we are striving to real independence. Yes. So when we elect a president, well, we, we, I guess there's not a lot of things that to show us that you'll be elected maybe for four years, five years, a lifetime, or whatever it is. As she said earlier, I was listening clearly because we elect a president as a republic country. We have to have a time frame or he can be elected for life. I believe that is one of the things that minister wants to discuss with the public. So we need to hear your voice. What do you think? Exactly. So I'm saying, when we elect that person as a president, say we become republic, what is there for the people? What, what, what substantial evidence that he will be for the people? And the things that we are elected this person for, he will uphold to these. Dr. Spence, you want to take that? Do you get yeah. my... Do you're you asking get about yes. accountability. How we make sure that the person who we elect do what we want them to do. Now that you're yeah. saying. All account. How do we hold them accountable? Exactly. Okay. Like right now, there's a lot of things going on. They are not holding accountable. Okay. So I'm just saying. We need to make sure that when we elect and when we put, when we discuss this matter of the constitution. When we that terminate. we also put in place um, some strategies to keep this president accountable. Precisely. You have any suggestions, any ideas? That is what I'm asking. All right. For instance, like in America, a president does something wrong, we impeach him, hold him accountable. 
imprisonment. But that is brilliant. So say it. I think we should have impeachment provisions. That we don't need to say a thing more. Put on your mic and go on. You say it. My, my, my brother, I will say this. Thank you. I, I'll say this. Right. And Nadine is right. And I'm agreeing with her. The former committee actually recommended that there should be impeachment provisions as we go forward. And that is a part of what we will also need to look at. So that's a very important question you ask. And impeachment is one way in which we can hold whoever is in that role accountable. Thank you. Now we're getting into the thing, Madam Moderator. Somebody asked about life appointment. What do you think would be a good term for the life of the president? Remember, the life of the parliament is five now. So what would be, and the president would be at a higher level. What term would you think would be appropriate? <laughs> We're hearing different things. We're hearing four. One at a We're time. One five. at a time. Let me see the hands of those who say four. Those who say five. Six. <laughs> Anybody's thinking two years? Oh boy, it split down the middle with almost all of those durations. So, if I may jump in here, this is a very important question. Hold on, hold on. Our co-chair wants to get a word and, in. Uh, to answer that question, we ought to consider again uh, why it is recommended that we have a head of state. The minister, in her earlier remarks, made a distinction between the state and the government. And we were trying to suggest that the state should be above politics. And so you want to consider how do you, in addition to the process of selecting the head of state, what else can you do to ensure that the head of state doesn't get mixed in with the party political processes? So one of the things you may want to consider is whether you want to have a term which will almost guarantee that the two will never coincide, that there will be some distance between them. And so you may want to consider whether a longer term than the term that is provided for the life of the parliament may be considered. And, you know, we have had recommendations, by the way. The recommendations have been between, say, seven years to nine years, that sort of thing. But um, whatever you recommend, uh, consider the fact that we want to if we separate the head of state from the head of government, we would like to ideally keep the head of state above the normal party political um, affairs. Thank you, you very much. You don't want a head of state that is going to come when one party is in power and change when another party is in power. You want it a head of state that would go across the divide yes. to maintain stability and to be above the politics. And this is in keeping, Minister, with the point you made earlier on, that the state sits above yes. the government. And so that would be ideal. Yes. You have a response, Mr. Thompson, but I believe I have somebody who is in the front row who has been waiting for a little while. So give him a, give him a chance, and we'll come back. Good evening. Um, my name is Joe Hilton, a Justice of the Peace in St. James. This question is directed primarily to the minister. At what stage is our final court taken into this consideration? The final court is not really out of the consideration right now, but the process to change the court is not a process that requires a referendum. Uh, and um, my good friend Anthony here, at every opportunity, has reminded that we can't really do this work without considering what the final court is. 
because so much work is involved in changing the constitution, breaking it and making it. The wisdom from those who have done it before, those who have studied it, say the better approach is to take it in stages. Otherwise, you're going to run into a whole heap of problems more than you can ever imagine. So the reason for this approach to put the work in phases and to organize it in such a way really has to do with who has to make the ultimate decision on the change. Not who is informing the decision, you know, because the decision must be informed by the people. But at the end of the day, who is going to make the decision for the change to happen? All right? Who's going to make it? So we're starting with the matters that say the people will ultimately have to make the decision. And then we go into what is stepped back, where the representatives of the people, both sides having to come together. We're going to have to talk about the final court because views are deeply divided on it right now. Some say keep the Privy Council right now because countries that have ended the monarch as their head of government have kept the Privy Council. Some say, but the Privy Council is tied to the monarch, the king. So for us in Jamaica who have the king as our head of state, when an appeal goes to the Privy Council, it's an advice to the king to allow or disallow the appeal. For a country like Trinidad that uses the Privy Council, it's a court in its own right. So the, the institution of the Privy Council has transitioned from just being an advisory committee to His Majesty the King to a court in its own right. But here is a problem. The court is in England. It says it will come to Jamaica to sit. It has never come. It hasn't come yet. But we need a visa to go to England. And there are issues around cost and access to justice. Those are issues that we will have to take seriously. So, because it's not a matter that requires a referendum, that's the next phase of the reform, right after we abolish the monarchy. There seems to be consensus on abolishing the monarchy, those who have had their say. But we don't have a consensus yet. But there is no getting around making a decision on which court should be the final court. Many are saying CCJ, the Caribbean Court of Justice. The opposition position is clear and strong on it. And others are saying, consider final court. When that matter comes up, we're going to have to weigh the arguments because there won't be any putting off of it. It's just that if we don't get this done, we may not get to that. May, may, I, may I just say a few words on that? Because I think for the people to practically consider this issue, I think more information needs to be put out into the public space. And so consider this as part of that process and the reason why the opposition feels very strongly about this. The, the truth is that Trinidad, which as the minister indicates, still has an appeal to the Privy Council. Trinidad does not have the obstacle that we have about getting a visa to go to their court. The truth also is that in the current situation, unless we heard from a businessman today, the, his perspective, and I, 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 don't, I don't say he was speaking for all business people, but he certainly was speaking for himself. His perspective was that the cost of litigating, of getting a decision in the, from the Privy Council was prohibitive. Not only that, he spent some time discussing the length, the time that it takes. He recognizes that for commercial matters, this is a problem as well. I want to suggest that where you have where you have these kinds of issues and concerns 
what actually happens in the law. And those of us who are in the law and practice the law knows that what you get are compromises very often because it, the, the decisions are so difficult, so expensive, that instead of vindicating your rights in contracts or in law, you tend to then compromise cases. That's not the best way to develop your law, your legal, and your jurisprudence. That's not the best way to do it. So access to justice, we contend, must be one of the values to this whole constitutional process. Access to justice. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. We're going to take one of the questions that we have from our participants who are online. Ms. Nichols, would you go ahead and just read one of those questions for us, please? Check, check. O'Shane Morgan is asking, if we become a republic, wouldn't our national emblem have to be changed? <laughs> Big question, yes. Some change is taking place already. I think the Jamaica Defense Force um, has already gone through a process of looking on what the change is. Interestingly, I was speaking to the police officers who are in here, and all their buttons have a crown on it. And that crown really should change as the crown changed from Queen Elizabeth to the monarch, which is a holy for money involved in changing. Simple answer is yes. But do we change it from Queen Elizabeth's emblem to King Charles' emblem, or do we just hold it and change it to the people's emblem? What do you say? Huh? Spend all of the money and change it? Right, when we can use the money for something else. But, but one of the other questions about the emblems ask is about the coat of arms. Asking whether we should change the coat of arms. These are matters that we will have to decide. As a matter of fact, you notice Costas is in the gold chair. So one of the other questions, <laughs> one of the other questions is what will happen to the office of Costas? And, you know, since Acostas represents the governor general who represents the monarch and the justice of the peace. So we have a whole lot of related matters. So in this first phase, in this first phase, once we move to abolish the monarchy and establish the office of president, we have a whole heap of other things that need to be done. And some of those things we can work out while the bill is going through the parliament, we can work those out. Because the work doesn't stop when the bill goes in the parliament. The three months between the tabling of the bill and the commencement of the debate, serious public education. The three months between the end of the debate and the taking of the vote on the bill, serious time. So we are in for a long time of reasoning teach and learn. As we share with you what is in your constitution, we have to hear from you how you would like to set it. It's really a teach and learn time for us. And so the question is, why no? And I would ask, if not no, when? If not no, when? Every time you ask, because, and I'm, I'm not just throwing the question at you. I'm really seeking an answer. When I looked on how much work was done by those who went before us. It's as if the people, I'm not saying that is so, I'm just saying an impression among the many impressions, were content with talking the, the issues to death without ensuring that the next step was taken to implement. At least we got the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedom implemented, and that came after about 20 odd years. Nadine, you said every generation must do its share of work. It is my hope that my generation in politics, elected in the democracy, will take the bold step to do what we shouldn't put off for any longer. Uh, Minister, I just wanted to say you can help me because, you know, I'm... I am just hugging up the Constitution and learning about it. Some other people know it a long time. But one of the things I learned is, and Minister, you can correct me or anybody else here, is that things like our, our, our flag, our national anthem, our emblems were not included in the Constitution. So um, 
part of what we have to do now is decide how do we include those in the Constitution. Because remember, one of the things that Minister explained was that the Constitution was written and then in Jamaica and then passed in, in um, Buckingham Palace. So some of the, somebody asked about the emblem. Some of those are not even in the Constitution currently. So as beautiful as our national anthem is, the Constitution doesn't formally recognize it. And um, Mr. Hugh Small online wanted me to say, the young man ha who raised the matter of impeachment, he said elected president. But remember, part of what we have to agree on is whether we elect directly a president or we you are ask our representatives to select and elect one for us. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spence. We're going to go straight to the floor again and to get as many of your questions as we possibly can before we wrap it up for this evening. Go ahead, sir. All right. Um, greetings, everyone. Everton Robbins is the name. I'm Justice of the Peace and also a Minister of Religion. And uh, Madam Minister, you preempted my question by responding to the Office of the Custos and the Governor General. But uh, there's another question that I want to ask uh, as it relates to finance. I, I want to know if it's a myth or if it's a reality that this could be our, it could leave a hefty cost on the country as it were paying for our freedom or not necessarily to become a republic, but to the abolishment of the king or the monarch. Is it something that is going to cost the country? Let me ask what you think, because everything comes at a price. Everything comes at a price. And sometimes when the question of cost is raised, I usually wonder, what is the price that we pay for not doing it? It's going to, for, for the process itself, to hold the referendum, it's going to equate to the cost of holding um, general elections. Yes, because that's really what it is. It's a taking of the poll. And even, you know, something, as the Senator Sinclair, just saying that even coming here comes at a cost. Let us not even talk about the money. But we have to travel because not everybody is from Montego Bay. We have to dedicate the time. We have to prepare and plan. You know, people say, we want to meet. Somebody has to organize the meeting. Somebody has to determine the venue. We have to determine the start time. We have to go get the help of our professional moderator who can take the questions and organize the thing. If to allow the members of the diaspora and Jamaicans abroad and those who are in other parts of Jamaica to participate, we had to get the screen to put in the technology in order to record it so people can view it. We had to get the videographers here. Everything comes at a cost. Thank you, Minister. I believe we have our President of the Chamber of Commerce here in Montego Bay who has a question at this time. Mr. Heaven, go ahead. It's on. Oh, yes, thank it's you. On. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Minister. Now, for this consultation, what I'm expecting to hear are suggestions and recommendations as to how we move forward. Another minister mentioned that we'll have, uh, this is phase one, which is the abolition of the monarchy, putting in place a republic, uh, which is the president. So the question is, what, as I hear arguments, but what suggestions are we moving forward with as to how will we elect or put in place, not even elect, but put in place a president as one? Um, and what, what, what are the, how, what consensus is there on and and selecting a president? The, Question was, another question was asked by the minister as to who want to get rid of the monarchy. And a few hands so for and against. The question is, in putting a Republic of Jamaica in place, what are the benefits of having that system? And what are we losing in getting rid, if we're losing anything in getting rid of the, 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 the king, uh, as it is? But, and and I, I must also uh, commend the... the the, the powers that be to move forward with this now because we know the 1995 Joint Select Committee on Constitutional and Electoral Reform, 1995. You know, so this, going ahead with this, but the questions or the suggestions that must come from the people is what do you want? The term limit was mentioned, the term limit, and as um, Senator is saying here, the, 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 the parliamentary term being five years, the, the, the 
president must transcend that five years. So seven, eight years is good, good suggestion that will come from, from me as, as an individual. But one of the suggestions from the people, it's your constitution. It's your children and grandchildren who's gonna live with this. So what are the suggestions? It can be about emotions, but about the reality as to how we move forward with this document that will govern and, uh, that will, govern and will be ruled by. So, Madam Moderator, if maybe we should get a sense from the people whether you agree that you're, we, you know, we want to put it above the partisan politics. And there would be good sense in ensuring that it is greater than the life of the parliament. So you don't have a head of state changing because you have election mm -hmm. for your head of government on your political party system. And what would a term of years, what, what would the term look like by way of years? Suggestions have come seven to nine, and um, Oral, you're saying seven, at least seven. Let's hear from you. What do you think? What, what year? We have to find a way, Madam Moderator, to <laughs> canvas the numbers. Yes. Let me see the hands of those persons who are saying seven. You, you know, it would, be, it would be good to know as well the reason why. Because I think the justification would help us as committee members to understand the thinking behind the number. And I believe the minister gave some information just now which would suggest why that recommendation is being made. I'm just hoping that everybody exactly. understands and will be willing to vote. Allow me to acknowledge Honorable Homer Davis who has since joined us. And Mr. Thompson, your hand is way up in the back. What, how many years you're saying? What term of office? Let me, may I, may I just, may I just say that the, the seven years, as was explained, was to avoid the, we agree in the committee there is a discussion around the role and function of the president, as was said. We want the president to be above the, 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 the cut and thrust of day-to-day -day politics. We want the, the president to represent unity and stability. To achieve that and to maintain that, you want to have a term of years that doesn't co coincide with the five-year election cycle. But there's also something else that is important and we discussed in the committee and yet to be finalized. It is how we choose because it is, it is that safeguard that will ensure in the first place that we have real consensus about who that person is. Because if you, if you get that right, then everybody's comfortable with the seven year because you have the right person for that time in the seven year time period. So there, there's an agreement broadly that the, the president would be elected by a college of electors formed by the, the House of Parliament and the Senate, the lower and upper House of Parliament, that there be a vote by that joint group. The question is whether that is a two, and, 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 and I think there's agreement on the two thirds um, vote. But the question is importantly whether that is taken separately or jointly. That's, a, that's an important question because as the minister pointed out earlier, that two-thirds majority is achievable from time to time in the House because of the electoral cycle. The creativity and imagination in the Senate appointment is very important, and that is what obtains now to preserve that union, that, that consensus around critical issues. And so that needs to be definitively finalized. The opposition is on record of having a two thirds voting separately in both houses. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. I believe we have a lady in the back who has a qu burning question. Mr. Thompson, find yourself near to the microphone in the back so you don't have to shout from where you are, but madam, please go ahead. 
Hello, good afternoon. I'm Rashi McKenzie, Youth and a Justice of the Peace. And I Ladies and gentlemen, please. I'm hearing a lot of questions, but I would love to give a solution, especially to Mr. Boswell. Um, I would love for you to see if you can have an extensive committee in all 14 parishes for youth. Um, I was also, I would love to also recommend that you have a debating competition. Instead of going into the schools and speaking to the youngsters, it can get a bit boring. And not all of us, we, we don't have the time for, sometimes you have different type of speakers, so maybe monotone. And we don't, we don't need that. <laughs> I think we need to come up with more creative strategies to engage youth. So a debate competition would be very much appreciated. And as an essay competition as well would be very much appreciated. Let them write even letters to the committee, right? So that the, you know, it, it gives them the opportunity to feel as though they are being heard. So you can, and I, I know this may be a bit far off, but I'm just thinking so far. <laughs> um, I would love to also suggest a television program. I don't know if you know what, what kids say on TVJ, where kids are able to give their opinions. No, I wouldn't want you to use that platform, but to develop a platform that would be focused on something like this, explaining to children what it means to become republic, what our history is about, and also there are some schools that are not taught civics. Please bring it back. Because if, we're, if, if kids understood what was going on, then they'd be a part of this discussion this afternoon. Thank you so much for hearing my recommendations today. Thank you very much. I'm sure Mr. Boswell is taking notes. I, 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 I want to say, and remember I said it earlier, I am not a singular voice for youth, and this is very reason why. You hear the brilliant suggestions, the extensive committee, and Roche, my very good friend, I hope that you're ready to lead out on it for me in the parish because we have to work together to get this done. Thank you. And just to say, Rush, even though I'm not youth, we have three debate competitions coming up. One, UE versus UTEC. One with high schoolers and the other one with public servants. And they're being organized by the Jamaica Association of Debaters for Empowerment. And they will be debating some of the topics that we've talked about tonight. We should have had the first one on Sunday but they've asked us for more time to prepare because the students are doing exams and they want to do good research. So we are going to be having the debate competitions. Thank you very much, Dr. Spence. And just to add to that, let us ensure that that debate, those debates are accessible to as many persons as possible. So it's not just within the confines of the university, but everyone can share in that as well. We have a question in the second row. Councillor, go ahead. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kerry Thomas, Council of the Mount CLM Division, right? And yes, Minister, I agree with your time come, <laughs> right? But, yeah, she said that earlier, time come, and I agree with her, right? <laughs> um, when I listen, and I listen, I hear we speak about how much no knowledge we have, or the public in general has much, much knowledge of what is in our constitution as it is now. Yet, we are ready to take another step to transition our country into being a republic. But the question we ask ourselves, are we ready? Are we ready to self-govern ourselves to that position? Are we responsible enough to each other, to our citizens, to everyone to be able to do it? Because as we, as we, as we, as we move forward, ladies and gentlemen, we, please allow him to. As we his move question. forward, and we look at just generally our respect for our country, our respect among ourselves as people, are we at that point? A simple, a very simple thing of. Um, I went to the movies recently, and we norm they normally play the national anthem. And there was a time when 100% of people stand to listen to our national anthem. But now we are at a stage where barely half, if so many, stand for the national anthem. It's very simple, but it's symbolic. How do we get our population to relate to our country, to relate to our values, to relate to those things? So in transitioning, 
to a republic, we have to also recognize it's not just about getting ourselves to that point to pass a law and make that change. It's about to get our population to be so educated and what we want to be to make us have a much better society because we must can relate to the greater good of what we intend to do. A lot of work is ahead of us. A lot of work is ahead of us. I just want to bring us back because time, our closing time is coming. No doubt there's a lot of work ahead of us. A lot of work to, to teach and learn, to educate and be educated. But do you agree that the president, as head of state, should represent unity and stability in the nation? As a broad, is there a broad consensus on that? I can't hear you. I still can't hear you. So the next question that flows from that, how do we choose? How do we choose? That's the next thing. So even just throwing that out, and you are signaling consensus, that is what we have grappled with in the committee. And, you know, the wisdom of it is kind of clear, and I'm happy. How do we choose? That's a question that we all need to consider. Um, Sir Bob, are you going you. to ask a final question? Yes. Do you have a comment, um, Ambassador? Yes, I wanted to just offer for consideration the question we were just asked about our maturity and readiness to govern ourselves. And I am sure I heard some rumbling, so I'm sure you have your perspectives. But let me just indicate one thing. At the moment, we are linked to the motherland that have been governing themselves for centuries. So you would assume they are mature enough to govern themselves, the UK, right? Well, would you believe that in the past six years, the UK has had five prime ministers, okay? In the past six years, there have been five prime ministers. And uh, we spoke about our democracy and there are criticisms of it and we will improve it. But one of the good things about us, no matter how much we quarrel with each other, when the people speak, at election time, we have always respected it. And I think we should give ourselves some credit for that. We have a strong democracy. It can be improved. We're working to improve it. But you look around the world at those countries that you think are mature enough to govern themselves, and you look at what has been happening in their governance compared to what has been happening with us. So I am not giving you an answer. I'm giving you something to consider when you try to decide if we are ready to govern ourselves. So Thank how you. do we choose our president? So we have a parliamentary... The proposal is for a parliamentary confirmation process. All right? Your parliament are the representatives of your people. It might not be where we end it, eh? because a hearing views about wanting to elect directly. I hear the views. So we're going to talk. All right. Thank you very much, Minister. And before that, Ambassador Rocky Mead, co-chair from the Office of the Prime Minister of this committee. Sir Check. Bob, your mic is live. Go I ahead. I feel like Peter touched a while ago. You know, Peter touched go on the stage. The mic didn't work. I feel like that a while ago. But anyway, Empress Malahu, Mr. Hilton, greetings. You know, the member said that we're not ready, but Rastafari has been promoting get rid of the king and the queen for a long time, so Rasta ready. Um, <laughs> we burn a fire for that. Tagline, Rasta ready, Rasta ready, all right. <laughs> um, right now, my brethren say he's from Ethiopia and he is an indigenous Ethiopian, but I'm an indigenous Jamaican. <laughs> um, 
Now that we've been governed by a minority government, uh, only 47% of people vote for JLPNP. So right now, the mi minority, the majority of the people right now want to have something to say about who will become our president. Will there be a referendum? That's all I want to ask. You just come in, referendum, yes. But remember, you know. Uh, one, uh, one second, ma'am. I had to make a quick run, but I was here for your speech. Uh, give thanks. Give thanks. Rasta ready. <laughs> Rasta ready and that Rasta. Pledge allegiance to Jamaica. All right. Um, what an enriching discussion. What an enriching discussion. How do we select? the president? That's an important Perfect. question. Yeah. Yeah. Remember now, you know, where we move from here after we cut ties with the monarch doesn't have to be our final step. All right? We're taking it in stages. But whatever kind of president you want, we can only get it if we start by abolishing the monarchy as our form of government. So immediate question is what is the process, what type of president, and what is the process by which the president would be selected. For what period, that's the term of the presidency, and what powers we will vest in the office of president. So do we agree that there are some things that we should put above the partisan politics that is part of the democracy, that they are important, we need to set them above it? You agree with that in principle? Can I hear you? All right, so we'll have to work out. If we know the principles and we agree to the principles, it becomes a lot easier to work out other things. And these are some of the guiding principles that we have been looking at. These are some of the guiding principles. Madam Moderator, I see someone is... Thank you very much, Minister. We're winding down, and so we're going to take just a few more questions, and I believe we have one person who has a burning question online. So, Senator, go ahead, and we'll take the question online after. How do I get this mic on? Okay, it's on. <laughs> there you go. All right, I have, um, in relation to the referendum, when you took a vote in the room, you had a few persons saying that they were in favor of the monarch, monarchy remaining, right? And you had some who said republic. And you had several persons who didn't vote. What does the committee consider as a favorable turnout on a referendum in respect to the vote? If you have a, 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 min, a minority of persons turning out to vote on the referendum. I'm just wondering if you have a... a so the referendum Sorry. does not require, the referendum just requires the majority, depending on how the vote is taken, of the people turning out to vote. So your democratic process, you know, respects the fact that people may not come out, but at the end of a process, it yields a result. So if you want to stay back when a referendum is called, the truth is that you would have to live with the result of the majority of the All people. Right. We ha there are other issues that we have to work on, why people are staying away, the apathy. Very well. And... The question that you touched on um, just a while ago in respect to how to select, elect a president. I've heard in the public for, forum, opposition saying one thing, government saying another thing. I don't know if that has changed in any particular way, but over the many years since 1962, since we have been appointing a governor general, a person who is above the fray, have we had a problem in how he has been appointed? Have we had a problem with the person who has been appointed as governor general? I don't think so. And if something is not broken, why are we proposing a change to that? Thank you, Senator. I don't know if there's anyone from the committee who wants to respond to that. To the best of my knowledge, no. And we have had governors general who have come out of the political class. We have 
Sir Howard Cook, for example, Sir Clifford Campbell, citing two from both sides, and there has not been any issue. We have managed to have governors general who have truly been above the fray. We have had them truly above the fray. But my friend Anthony was saying, we're looking forward, not so much backward, but he also said that, you know, the things that have been tried and tested that we don't have problem with, let us consider seriously why we would discard them. Um, yeah, so, so... If it's not broken, then why do we need to fix it? I believe that is... I think what I hear from the people is that some way, somehow, they want their say. My simple answer is that the system... Nadine, I think you were the one who put it well about systems and, and processes. So you elect your representative, and having elected them, many things flow from that process of putting them in place. But we have to work on how they account to you, how they account to us. And I would say, Senator, that for me, there is no holy grail in our consideration. I think even if we go back to ex for it to stay exactly how it is, we should discuss it. And if we want to quarrel over it, I feel we're busy to make we quarrel, right? But nothing should be left untouched. There's no sacred cow in this process. We must question everything. And it, it's only after the questioning of everything that the people of Jamaica, me included, will say, it's mine even if we keep what was there before. Yeah, yeah. I think it's very important that we ventilate um, the discussions and we speak about it. And that's why I really wanted to hear persons saying two. There must be a reason why they're saying two. So we have to allow the process of engagement to allow for that type of discussion and conversation because the views must be heard. And in our own deliberations, we have to debate the views. I've been collecting views from young people. There have been over 150 youth who've done a survey to give their points. And the truth is, just as how there are diversity in views in this room, there are diversity in views in how we should approach. There's a diversity in views as to what issues should be a part of the, the constitutional reform process. And at some point, we have to have those discussions and to engage on them. Thank you, Mr. Boswell. We're going to take one question online, and then we have two other questions within the room, and then we're going to ask Minister just to put a lid on things for this evening's town hall meeting. Go ahead, Ms. Nichols. Online, Kirk Freighter is asking, but even if we get a president, he or she will still do the Governor General's role? No, the president, well, well. So the Governor General carries out important functions as head of state, ceremonial functions, executive functions. Governor General has power to act in his own right, but the Governor General represents the king. So. The, the thinking so far is to look at the ceremonial powers and look at the substantive executive powers. And we have been speaking mostly around um, appointments to sensitive positions that we believe is not in the best interest of the nation to have them politicized. You know, the quality of service that you get from government is a reflection of the quality of your civil service and your public service. And politicizing the civil service has not helped Jamaica at all. I'll give you two extremes. When the party that is in power, that the political people represent, are from, two extremes. One, they will say, I don't have to do anything. Can nobody now fire me? My party in power, I don't have to do a thing. And the people are not served. And you can have another extreme. My party is not in power. I'm not doing a thing to make this governing party look good. And you have sabotage. The people are not served. Those are the extremes. You have things in between. And we have gone through periods where right now the people are not being well served by government. And everybody expects the political directorate to step in and do everything. I have learned so much from being an MP, so much. When I tell people that the face of government you see, if you go to the tax office, is going to be the face of the person who is serving you. And if that person serves you well and courteously and efficiently, that's the face of government. If them sour and inefficient, his them teeth by you and all of that, that's the face of government. It's not the minister or the MP who is able to be the face of government at that time. 
And we have to make people understand what it means to be a public servant and a civil servant. We don't want no politicization going forward of our civil service. We need the people to be served because the bureaucracy has not delivered results to the people. And that's one of the changes that must come out of this. And so, appointments to these important office where the people must be served outside of politics, regardless of your politics. And don't knock the politics because the competitive politics is the lifeblood of the democracy. We just need to behave better with integrity, right? And our word must mean something, and we must do the work on behalf of the people. Thank you, Minister. There's a young man in the back who has a question. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mikhail Brown. My question is, what are three benefits to Jamaica in moving away from the monarchy and becoming a republic? Also, three negatives as it relates to international relations, which may accompany this move. Three benefits and three negatives as it relates to international relations. Mr. Well, Hilton? Let me, let me start with the, what is for me the easier one, because having served as foreign minister for Jamaica, I can tell you, that the way countries look at other countries and, and size them up. Sometimes in the diplomacy, you don't get a frank discussion about that. But you can tell from what is many times not done or benefits that you could accrue from different types of relationship not happening. What do I mean by that? Countries that are self-governing countries. In the, in the community of nations, they know who are actually independent and who are not. They know our structures of government. It's the business of every government to know about other governments. And not just on a surface level. They dig deep. They try to understand the politics, how things work who makes decision, are these real people, real governments, or are they, are they um, paper governments, or governments that are not strong and self-determinative government. These are assessments that are made in our, in our foreign relations, okay? So my, one of the benefits, I believe, to move into a republic um, system is really that other governments looking on can see a responsible people, a people who understands the challenge of being a republic, the challenges um, of taking responsibility, but do so and do so well. So it, it, it is for me about as much about how the people themselves feel about themselves and how that is communicated to the rest of the world. The world is observing, the world is listening, and the world takes notes. It, it takes note of what and how the country decides. So this process will be watched very, very closely by governments internationally. Can I, can and it's I, an important I, question. I want, I want to add to that to say in becoming a republic, one of the significant benefits is the opportunity that it now provides for us to learn from our history of some 60 years of putting in place the kind of governance arrangements that ensure greater accountability and responsibility of those who govern our nation. That's very, very important because there is a direct link, I would, I would suggest, between how we are governed and issues of corruption, issues that cause us a lot of pain, even the crime and violence. And we need to look at those issues. Should our parliamentarians, for example, be ministers of government or should they be focused on representing us, the people, whilst we pick our best from among us to be ministers of government? 
those are the kinds of things that if we, if we focus our minds on the kind of governance arrangement we have, that would be a significant benefit that could come out of this exercise as we engage this process, ask those kinds of questions, and create the kind of republic that we need. So a republic is not just a, a word. We need to ask ourselves, how are we going to govern ourselves so that the people really are supreme in the governance of our nation? That's a benefit. If I could add one other one is that you know, we talked about the fact that the 1961 Constitution didn't really involve all of us. Like perhaps we weren't at the place that we could have had that discussion at the time, but I think certainly now we can. And I really like the fact that we are here disagreeing and agreeing on what is in our Constitution. Like this is, I don't know if you know how phenomenal this is. That this is, this is one of the first time it's not the first time, but that this is happening now, that we are having this conversation. And I think it means that we are willing to take ownership of our constitution. It means that every one of you should leave here and start asking, where do I get a constitution? I want to see that old one. That's a level of personal responsibility it asks us to take. And that we gather at home, at church, in school communities, in, in, in clubs and start for ourselves having the discussion about what is in this thing. And that is, I think, a part, a first part of that important process of becoming sovereign people. Um, that we are ready to quarrel over what should be ours. And like, the quarrel is good. I love the quarrel because it means that we are ready to take charge, own it, and say, you know, we put whatever is in here, we put it in here, or the reason why it is in here is because we agreed that it, is, it should stay. And that is, that is, to me, an important positive to it. I don't see any negative, but I know other people have negatives. But to me, the fact that at this point, us as people in Sam Sharp Square, remember Sam Sharp Square was, was hung somewhere downstairs, you know? 1831, Sam Chris, the rebellion, and the, Sam Sharp, right? <laughs> Montego Bay is an important point of reference for this idea of re rebellion, uh, which is why I personally wanted it down here, because Montego Bay and the environs is a clarion cry to the rest of Jamaica. We are going to burn down something. <laughs> and this is where we started it. And this is where we started it then. And this is where we are going to start it now, right? This is where we have to start it, where Sam Sharp and his people decided that we are going to, once and for all, this thing done. And we are going to extend Sam Sharp's work. That's what we are doing. We are extending Sam Sharp's work. I don't see no negative in it. I know people see negative. Me personally, Nadine Spence, I don't see no negative in it. We owe Sam Sharp. And all those people who were hung downstairs, we owe them to finish that work. I don't want us to go burn down anything literally now. <laughs> what we want is to mash up the Babylon system and establish Zion. All right, Minister, thank you so much. We are out of time, I believe, but there's one hand in the back that we're going to take. No, I'm Hello. seeing three hands, no. but we can only take one more question. Hello. And the gentleman who has the mic, Hello. Nurse Crooks, I see you, but you're going to have to ask the question. Mr. Peter King, I see you, but we're going to have to ask those questions off air because we're going to have to wrap it up, at least this segment of the discussions. And I'm really happy that there's just a lot of passion and a lot of persons want to ask questions. But let's see if we can end with the gentleman who has the microphone and we can... P.S., you have a question, too? Yeah. Hello? We can take the three questions. All right, so it's Nurse Crooks, Mr. Peter King, and the gentleman who has the microphone. And then we're going to wrap it up. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Hello, um, I'm Dr. John Lennon. Um, I want to know how the Constitution, a new Constitution, will protect our natural re well, our resources in general. Because at the moment... Oh, at, at the moment... Um, they've been exploited, especially by foreign um, investors. So if you look at bauxite, between 2017 and 2020, 
bauxite earned 3.215 billion US dollars, but the Jamaican people received only two million dollars. Well, that can't be right. When Wildelco is actually unprofitable, an unprofitable company cannot benefit Jamaica. And yet, right now, it is there, they're mining and they're poisoning the, the, the um, Rio Cobre and they've ruined people's. Yeah, so the constitution isn't protecting these people. So I want to know if the new um, constitution will protect our people and protect our resources. But money is also a resource. And if you look at our debt, we always hear that the debt is falling. That's all we ever hear, the debt is falling. In 2013, the debt was a, just a little bit below two trillion Jamaican dollars. At the end of 2022, the debt was actually 2.2 trillion. So the debt has actually gone up. But worst of all, over 3 trillion was spent servicing it. So again, we need a constitution to protect us against the foreign investors who were lent us money and then we, we can't repay it. And the third thing is we need to protect our, res um, our um, natural resources from um, such as solar. Now our energy policy is built for private investors. We have um, at the Mona Reservoir, foreign investors have put in, so are going to put in some floating solar panels. The cost of that is um, 62.5 million US. Now I've calculated it that the foreign investors are going to be making in the region of 20 million a year. So it's going to pay for itself in under four years. This is um, the people should have put this in and we should be benefiting from it. So it's a case of will the new constitution have in place everything so that we are not exploited anymore? So I say we are bauxite, our energy and our money. Thank you, phase Minister. Two, phase two, we are going to look back on the rights guaranteed. But we do have an environmental right provision here that needs to be enforced. And um, we'll have to look at, as um, David had said, whether we expand it and how we ensure that the benefits are guaranteed to the people. What a day. When, when you're ending and people want more, that's a good sign. I just want to just scan you again. Can, I go, can we go away from this process saying that we have broad agreement that the Office of President for the New Republic of Jamaica should be um, above the fray and represent and embodies national unity and stability? Yes? You have to say that loudly. All right. Because from that principle, other things will flow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Our PS said we should allow two more. So, Mr. Peterkin and Nurse Crooks, right. please. Good Go ahead. evening, everyone. I'm Joy Crooks. I just want to ask one quick question. What would be the job description of the president? Ms. Crooks, that's a big, big question, you know. <laughs> I can't put it in synopsis, but... The president is going to be the head of state, protecting. It, it's, a, it's such an important question, and it's a big part of this work. But if I tell you, head of state, embodying national unity, making critical appointments to critical things, um, offices, um, dealing with sensitive offices, it's a question that you should have asked at the start, because now that we're running out of time, a whole heap. But having raised it, having raised it, we will probe it for you and come back with a full answer. Because no, no, we have gotten to the meat of the matter. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Mr. Peterkin, quickly. Yeah, good evening, everybody. I didn't know that this uh, forum was taking place, but um, I would like to touch on the governance, general governance, governance issue. You raised it, sir, the gentleman in the stripe shirt. Um, what are you going to put in place to ensure that the
politicians going forward are actually accomplishing what they're supposed to do. Talking about a job description. In my area, I have persons that I hire that are con constantly complaining about not seeing the minister, the minister not doing whatever, whatever. Even though I know the minister is extremely busy and is doing a wonderful job, but the citizens have to feel it. And they say Jamaica is poor. We're not, we're not a poor country. What we are is a country that doesn't use its resources properly. Because I guarantee you, if we were able to spend all the monies that are allocated to do whatever, and the monies are not siphoned off to do whatever, stolen in some cases, because I've actually had persons that proudly talked about getting um, benefits that they, they don't deserve when their party is in power. What are we going to put in place to make sure that politicians actually go to jail when they steal? You know, we are not poor. We're just not using our resources properly and people have resigned their, their, themselves. Everybody in my village think it's okay to thief because politicians thiefing, big man thiefing, um, them thiefing, you see, and bulls money and whatever. So <laughs> what we need to do is to be able to prove to the people that, that we are taking our responsibilities seriously. We are spending the, the, um, the, our resources, the people's resources, properly. And I guarantee you, Jamaica will just soar. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peter King. Okay, as well. Dr. Henry is going to take a shot at that question, or those questions. I don't have the answer. I have some ideas. But those are the kinds of questions that we need to wrestle with at this juncture. Because that's where the rubber hits the road. And we need to tackle those. And I'm looking forward to us really as a people engaging in answering those questions. How do we hold those who represent us accountable? That's a true republic. Can I, go, can I have, take a go at it, Mr. Peter King? Can I, can I try and answer you? You have 30 so, seconds. So when people talk about corruption in Jamaica, one of the things I say is this. I think Jamaica has, in my opinion, one of the most sophisticated anti-corruption framework anywhere else in the world. MOCA, Integrity Commission, on every Thursday, um, public officials sit in front of parliament and they are questioned. Everybody, if, if everybody gets questioned. We have boards that are appointed and that are made up of ordinary citizens. And boards are expected to also ensure that our finances and our resources are expended appropriately. And we have the investigative a capacity in our police force and other entities to do the work. But I think a lot of Jamaicans don't recognize that our anti-corruption framework is really very good. And that when people are held to book, they are actually charged and arrested. But I think what we need to do is promulgate more information so that our people can build more trust in the institutions and processes that have already been built. So do we, wait, wait a minute, Miss, let me finish. Do we have more steps to go? Of course, we could do with impeachment provisions as well. But we're not so bad. I'm telling you the truth. We're not so bad. You see, if I thought we were bad, I would say we have a whole heap of distance to go. But I think we've covered some of that distance already. We are on our way. We can improve, but right now we're not so bad. Minister. Some serious business, you hear? Holding people to account for the jobs entrusted to them is a serious problem in Jamaica. While you have your frustration about the MP, and I'm not just saying personalizing it, using myself as an example, I have so much frustration about the rest of government that I have to rely on to get the work done for the people. After I go and make the representation, I am not the road builder. I am not the one actually doing it. And I go and I make the representation. I get the, the road on a list, and then I have to wait for other parts of government to do their work. Because government is not a one-man show. 
The political directorate, as important as it is, it set the stage and the tone for leadership. But by virtue of number, we have more people in the other parts of government. And a big part of it is how do we hold everyone who is to serve the public accountable. What I have found, and it's not unique to me, because they know at the end of the day the heat is coming only on the politician. They don't have to do anything because whether they act or they don't act, nobody's hauling them out and helping and calling them to account. Government is not a one-man show. And a big part of this work is how we are going to work out the distribution of power, the governance, and holding people to account. We have a lot of work. But what a good, what a good time we have had. What a good time we have had. Wow. So my constituents know that we reason things out, right? We have different groups. And I say to others, I don't know what happened in your community groups, you know, but I have some community groups where they are issue focused and they are hard debaters and they bring the evidence and they push me and push me and push me. And when my colleagues get frustrated, I just have to say, look, I have to represent the people's view because these are the things that matter to them. Some of them are in this room and they know that the conversations are tough because they are re dealing with real problems. But as Nadine say, we are hard on ourselves. We are so hard on ourselves. Anthony will tell you in the international community because we both have experience as foreign ministers. A lot of people look to Jamaica. When you compare even as we have problems, we are ahead of many on many things. So as we wrap up, I want to say that this process of reforming the Constitution is going to bring a lot of issues to the fore, a lot of things. We are hearing you out. We can't address them all at once. We have to sequence the step. We have to face the work in order to get it done. It doesn't matter what we want if we're not prepared to make that important first change. The other things we want will never come. So, let us keep focus. This work is going to take many years to complete. Many years to complete the education of the people. Because when you know something, you know, nobody can fool you up about it. Right? When you know where to find it, and part of it is the writing the Constitution in simpler language. And after we have written it, to break it down and to make it available to the people in layman's term so that you can understand it. That's part of what excites me about this work. We talk about getting to a lawful society, dealing with the disorder, dealing with the lawlessness. If we don't know why we have the rules and why the rules matter, people are not going to, ad to, to, to abide by them and obey them. This is not about bringing a system forward right? That, that mash you down. No, we want to mash it up, but we want to do it in a way that we don't mash up ourselves in the process. So let's take the step. Let's take the step. We're listening. We really are listening. It's not a done deal. Your views matter. Your voice count. We want to hear from you. And this is a good start at this place in St. James. Nadine, tell you her reason for choosing some, this place, but I think my bias is clear. <laughs> I need not say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Honorable Marlene Malahu Fort, Member of Parliament, and of course our Minister, with a very important work ahead of her. I want to thank you for being here and for sharing your passion and all the information that you have with us this evening. Let me thank Ambassador Rocky Mead, our co-chair from the Office of the Prime Minister. We also want to thank Mr. Anthony Hilton, Parliamentary Opposition in the House of Representatives. Dr. Elaine McCarthy, who prayed for us earlier on and who has been a part of this committee representing the Jamaica Umbrella Groups of Churches. Dr. Nadine Spence, representing civil society. And of course, Mr. Suje Boswell, who I knew when his eyes were at his knees, and now he's sitting tall in that chair over there representing our young people. I'm, I'm really delighted. And I believe I missed out Dr. David Henry, did I? Thank you so much. Also representing 
the wider society and faith-based community. Let me thank our permanent secretary, Mr. Wayne Robertson, who is head of the secretariat, who is here with us this evening. And of course, a special thanks to the new CEO of the St. James Municipal Corporation. Good to have you, Madam, Nadia Crosskill, and for facilitating this discussion here this evening, providing us with this space and all of whatever else is to come. All the folks who spoke earlier on, our Honorable Bishop Custis, Rotolorum for our parish, Bishop Pitkin, thank you so much, President of the Chamber, Senator Charles Sinclair, and of course, Honorable Homer Davis, good to have you, sir. All of those persons representing different communities, different civic groups, different organizations, our justices of the peace who came out in their numbers this afternoon into evening time, members of the media, and of course, the Jamaica Information Service that allowed us to carry all of what was happening here today to other persons across the globe, yes, and those persons from the diaspora who joined us via Zoom, everyone who made it possible this evening. We could not have done it without you. And I have two takeaways that I want to just share with you before I go. This road to Jamaica becoming a republic. Yes, it is about Jamaicanizing the Constitution, but it cannot happen without your input. I'm going to share those, that email address and those are the numbers that we got earlier on. It's actually on the screen. Great. mlca.gov.jm. And then, of course, you have at mlca.gov.jm for the social media handles. The email address is there. You can send your ideas, send your questions. 876-441-9097. The number that you need to send your WhatsApp messages to. Participate. Enumerate to participate. The words of the Costas earlier on. Because if you don't have a ticket, you don't have a chance, right? It has been a pleasure hosting this forum this evening. And I trust that as you go, you will share the information in your respective groups. Everybody has a sphere of influence. Share the information and ask the relevant questions. How do we choose our president? What is the tenure that we want for that person? What powers will be vested in such an individual? All of the questions that you heard, good questions coming this evening. So I urge you to continue the discourse and enumerate to participate. On behalf of the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs, it has been my honor and my pleasure. Have a good evening. As children, we learn the true meaning of being a hero. Being a hero requires great sacrifice for others, for others, not just ourselves. We learn about the heroes of Jamaica's past and how much of themselves and their lives they had to give in building a nation we should be proud to call home. They believed in a Jamaica that was more than just a country, more than just an island, more than land surrounded by water. They believed in a dream of a free nation of people. A nation built on the foundation of their sacrifices. A nation of many people working as one. A nation that will continue to produce legends and nation builders that serve towards that vision. As children, we were also taught the national pledge, a solemn promise, an undertaking. I would like to believe Sir Hugh Sherlock, while writing this pledge, understood the vision and dreams of our heroes. It's clear being a hero is too much to ever ask any one citizen. Luckily, the pledge does not require heroics of any of us. It merely asks that we honor our heroes by striving to advance our nation and ultimately inspire the world. 
like they and many Jamaicans have done. It's important we remember those words. These words. Before God and all mankind, I pledge the love and loyalty of my heart through wisdom and courage of my mind, the strength and vigor of my body in service of my fellow citizens. I promise to stand up for justice, brotherhood and peace, to work diligently and creatively, to think generously and honestly, so that Jamaica may, under God, increase in beauty, fellowship and prosperity, and play her part in advancing the welfare of the whole human race.